So I'm now going to move to the main part of the event, having done those, those uh, <clears throat> preliminary opening um, points, and thank our wonderful speakers. And um, we're going to be hearing from Alicia and, and Stephen in a moment. And as I said, our colleagues here who are from Tanzania, both the researchers from CAMFED as well as from the government. Um, now this for us is a really important moment. The Real Centre is soon to be celebrating its 10th year anniversary. 10 years has gone very quickly. The engagement with CAMFED started from the inception of the Real Centre. And indeed, the launch of the Real Centre was done in collaboration with CAMFED, as well as some of the speakers and participants in the room. So Julia Gillard, who is going to be sharing some reflections later, was part of, of our launch. Um, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, um, who Alicia is here representing today, has also been a very close partner of ours throughout, including through the work that we've collaborated on, on the Girls' Education Challenge, which has also been supporting CAMFED. So for us, it sort of feels like this is an important event of bringing many of the strands of our work together. These relationships have evolved and strengthened over the past 10 years. And an important feature of this work has been the co-creation of research, which we'll be hearing more about from our participants today. This research and this collaboration has very much started um, before the research even starts and has continued after it ends, and we'll be hearing about that during the discussions. Now, over the past 10 years, much more is known about the barriers to education that the most marginalized girls face. That's partly thanks to the Girls' Education Challenge and other initiatives that many of you in the room here have no doubt been part of. And we have also seen much progress in terms of achieving parity in, in the number of girls and boys in school. And that is wonderful news and something that we should celebrate. Questions remain on how best to harness this momentum and to harness, more, more importantly, the transformative power of education, both through ensuring that such change is sustained within education systems themselves, and that progress in education bears fruit beyond schools and into the wider communities and societies. And an important aspect of that, which will be a focus of today's event, is looking at how education and how this transformative power of girls' education in particular can help to shift gender social norms that in many societies can hold back opportunities for girls and young women. So these are the issues that we'll be focusing on. The focus of the research that will be discussed today was identified by CAMFED as a priority for their organization and through their collaboration with government um, in Tanzania. So very much from the outset, the questions that were being asked, the focus of it was not us researchers sitting here in Cambridge or in the University of Dar es Salaam and thinking this is what we think might be interesting, but rather CAMFED and um, colleagues from the Ministry of Education and, and government saying this is what we need, this is where we need evidence, this is what we want to understand. And so this, this important sort of process has actually been part of, very much part of um, our work overall. Of course, as researchers with the University of Dar es Salaam and those of us in Cambridge, we have been the ones responsible for designing the research, undertaking that research independently, providing that evidence that can help inform the government's programming, CAMFED's programming, but also importantly here, the wider global <coughs> education community. And we like to think, and hopefully that, uh, at least here, that FCDO is listening and takes on board the evidence that comes from research of this kind, and also to, uh, as do other organisations. The research has already been disseminated in Tanzania um, with government, with the young women who are part of CAMFED's program, um, with students in the university. And so this is sort of accumulation that we're wanting to sort of also bring together um, here in Cambridge. Uh, so I think importantly, this co-creation is what has been, is being seen as sort of more and more important. Um, and for some, it's been called implementation science. I know that we've got a colleague here from the What Works Hub for Global Education, which is um, just fully starting up in the first year. Um, and implementation science is at the heart of the What Works Hub. But I think there's a lot of debates. What do we mean by what, what implementation science? And for us, it's really breaking it down into working in collaboration with implementers, with government from the outset, of really sort of making sure that research is relevant and applicable and to make sure it then feeds back and is 
taken up in ways that are appropriate for, for those implementers. So in a sense, I think what we're doing here is implementation science in practice, and I hope there'll be lessons that can be learned both from the research <coughs> itself as well as the process of the research. So we look very much looking forward to the discussions today and to hearing from our speakers. I'm now going to hand over to Stephen Twigg, who is the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and Chair of the Council for Education in the Commonwealth, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you. I just want to make, before introducing our keynote speaker, three uh, very quick points drawing upon my own experience. And I guess to put that in a context that will be well known and understood by everyone who's here, we know that we face a huge scale of challenge in seeking to deliver the sustainable development goals in general and including sustainable development goal four with its commitment to genuinely open quality and accessible education for all. And the three points that I want to make are firstly picking up very much on Pauline's theme of evidence and research. Secondly, to say something about the importance of long term thinking and finally something on leadership. In my previous role as chair of the International Development Committee in the House of Commons, which is how I met Pauline and quite a lot of other people who are here uh, today, one of the things I was very struck by was the importance of better engagement between the policy making, legislative and government world and the world of academia and uh, politics, and we're in this country at the beginning of a general election campaign, politics is often uh, dominated by what can appear to be at least short-term goals and priorities, yet so many of the biggest challenges, including on education, are very much about the long term. And I certainly felt in that committee that we learned a lot from our engagement with academics, including with Pauline and her team here at the Real Centre, but also the importance of engaging with a diverse range of academics, both those that are well established in old universities, but also newer academics coming through from all parts of the world, not just from the particular country that we were working in. But then, as Pauline was saying just now, the importance not only of their research, but also the processes around that research and ensuring that in taking evidence and trying to have evidence informed policy that we drew, drew upon the range of voices, including from citizens and civil society, as well as from the academic community. So events like today, I think are incredibly valuable in highlighting the importance of the best research, best evidence, but also how that interfaces with citizens and civil society and with governments, legislators and other policy makers. And the long term aspect of this, I think, is of critical importance and it's very challenging in the political world and the policy world when there are so many events, so many pressures that can di divert from uh, those long term goals. And as we look towards 2030 and the goals that were set back in 2015, it's clearly going to be hugely challenging to come even close to the many targets and indicators that were set through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We need to be thinking about what happens next and in particular, how questions of equity, including girls access to education, to quality education are part of that continued conversation moving forward. It is a challenge to deliver a political consensus domestically, let alone globally, for those long term development goals. But I think it's a critical challenge that we have to try to rise to. And as Pauline said in introducing me, my current work is Commonwealth focused, both my day job at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, but also chairing a small organisation called the Council for Education in the Commonwealth. And recently, the Commonwealth Education Ministers met in London. It was an opportunity to focus uh, on some of the education challenges and the differences that can be made within the Commonwealth. And I think I would certainly be interested in conversations today, including in the margins of today's event, to have a, an understanding of how the Commonwealth itself could do more 
to focus on education. And this is particularly pertinent, I think, this year, because the Commonwealth heads of government will meet in Samoa, in the Pacific, in October, and they will elect a new Secretary General who will almost certainly be from Africa. And this is, I think, a great opportunity uh, if the African members of the Commonwealth want this for education to be a high priority for that new Secretary General. And the final thing is about the importance of leadership at all levels, at the institutional level, the local and regional level, nationally and uh, globally. We know that. We know it's vital in celebrating leadership that we recognize diversity and that we're listening to diverse voices of leadership. And all of you in this room in different ways have shown leadership on the critical challenges that we are discussing here today. Especially it's important that we are showcasing uh, women's leadership and girls' leadership in these discussions. I look forward to hearing later today from uh, Julia Gillard, but I am absolutely delighted in the spirit of that uh, emphasis on evidence and research, on taking a long-term approach, but also on leadership to introduce our keynote speaker here this morning. And I'm really, really pleased that I've been given the privilege and opportunity to do this, to introduce Alicia Herbert, who has shown uh, consistent, principled leadership on these questions, both of education in general, gender and education in particular, and gender more broadly. I think she will be known to many, if not most, of you. She heads up the work of the uh, UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office on education, and she is the UK Special Envoy for Gender Equality. And the theme of her keynote address today is transforming education outcomes and gender equality. Please give a very warm welcome this morning to Alicia Herbert. Thank you very much. Um, good, good morning to all. And it's for me, it's always, always a pleasure uh, to come to Cambridge a few decades ago. Um, tells you something about my age. A few decades ago, uh, I was at university here um, and it was probably one of the best periods of my life. Thoroughly enjoyed myself, did a bit of studying around the edges, uh, but absolutely a fantastic time. Uh, and lovely as well to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience. And indeed, huge thanks as well for that very warm welcome, Stephen. The last time I did a talk, Stephen also introduced to me, so it's coming a bit of a habit, becoming a bit of a duo, uh, as it were. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Pauline and to uh, the Real Centre and the Faculty of Education. And really pleased as well that, of course, here we've got today not only the Faculty of Education, but also the University of Dar es Salaam. I'd also like to thank uh, Lucy and Camford for inviting me here today as well. Uh, Camford's journey has been a remarkable one, one from a small NGO with a big vision and that's just recently been celebrating now its 30th anniversary. They have an excellent track record of success over time, including as a dedicated partner to the UK, particularly on our girls' education challenge, which very recently we celebrated uh, the conclusion, or we're coming to the, to the conclusion of the girls' education challenge. And our funding and collaboration with uh, Camford uh, in Tanzania, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Ghana, have transformed the lives of almost 600,000 girls uh, in Africa. But Camford's mission, we know, goes beyond girls' education, nurturing marginalized girls and young women to become the next generation of self-assured, influential, and respected leaders. I firmly believe that at some point in the history of the African continent, a Camford girl would become a prime minister or president on that continent. <laughs> I have, I have seen Camford's work on the ground. And I have seen the energy uh, and the commitment and, and the impact that these young women are having. And definitely, I think the future of the continent definitely lies in one or many, many of those young women. Tens of thousands of, of these girls, of Camford girls and young women have joined the Camford Association and become powerful and successful educators and entrepreneurs. They use the education not only to improve their own lives, but those of their families and their communities too. Camford believe in the power of education 
to drive transformational change across generations. I am also a passionate believer in the importance of education for social transformation and intergenerational change. A passion that was born out of my personal experience of growing up in a household in Trinidad in the Caribbean with parents for whom education was the be all and end all. It was not an option. The way in which the school system operated in the Caribbean, and it still does, you end the school term in July, and then you start again in September. My parents would buy our books, textbooks, they weren't provided by the school, that's a whole other equity issue there. <coughs> buy those books on, the, on that last day, the beginning of the summer holiday for the follow on term. And the whole point of that, my father used to say is that you can get ahead of everyone else <laughs> um, by the time you get uh, to September. So it certainly was not an option. And I witnessed that transformational change, that intergenerational change in my own family, and indeed with the countless families and households that I have met over the years in my work. But the truth is that far too many education systems today are under stress and strength and threatening the transformational impact of education. And while there's been impressive leaps in access over the past few decades, the job is far from done. UNESCO reported late last year the 250 million children are now out of school, a rise of 6 million since 2021. And indeed, a number of external factors have conspired and come together to reverse some of those hard won gains in education. It's what I tend to term the four C's, and many of you, you'll be familiar with this. And the first of those C's is around the long tail of COVID. And many children have, have simply not returned to school, and many have lost out for a lifetime of opportunity as well. I remember very, very clearly going to Uganda in 2022. It was during the very first week of the return to school after two years, two full years of kids being out of school. And you could see the struggle. They'd lost learning over two years. They were now trying to get back into the rhythm of that day. And indeed, I think the positive was that here they were and they were in a safe environment. But you could tell that the teachers and the students were trying to reset that relationship. And no, they didn't have any access to e-learning and computers at home. That wasn't happening during those, that two-year period. So the lost learning during that COVID period and now having to make up for that is definitely a challenge that we, all of us are facing. The second C is around climate and environmental change, which is already disrupting the education of about 40 million children a year. Yet without harnessing the power of education, we are unlikely to solve the climate crisis. Quality education is essential for reducing vulnerability, for improving communities' resilience and adaptive capacity, identifying innovations, and for empowering individuals to be part of the solution to climate and environmental change. So we've got a long tail of COVID, we've got a climate crisis, and of course, we've got conflict as well, the third C, unfortunately, which has stalled or even reversed progress in many places, with humanitarian needs at the highest levels since 1945. Conflicts in countries like Ukraine, conflicts in Gaza, uh, Afghanistan, Sudan, Niger, and the, the list goes on are having a devastating impact on millions of children with mass displacement and destruction of education facilities. The combination of the climate crisis and conflict in central Sahel, for example, has led to a six-fold increase in school closures since 2019. And then finally, the fourth C that I tend to talk about is around conservatism. Women's and girls' rights are under attack. We've now got an emboldened anti-rights movement comprised of state and non-state actors, and they're rolling back and undermining the decades of hard-won progress. This is occurring at all levels, at the regional level, at the multilateral level, at the local level, and online. And while opposition has always existed, we are now witnessing a far greater, better organized, well-financed transnational movement as accelerating the erosion of these rights. But the movement is also chipping away at what children are learning at school with changes in the curricula as well. So we got COVID, we got climate, 
conflict and conservatism. And while education systems struggle to keep pace with population growth, the impact of these four C's, as I term them, it means that insufficient attention is also being paid and resources not focused enough on what is going on in the classroom. And by this, I mean the quality of education being provided. And what's driving this? Well, children arriving at school unprepared to learn, teachers often lack the skills or motivation to teach effectively. Vital inputs like textbooks and teaching materials aren't reaching the classrooms, or if they do, they aren't helping to improve learning. Weak school management and governance is also feeding into this, undermining the quality of schooling. And at the heart of this, education systems in low-income settings are often too focused on schooling of the elite rather than schooling for all. As a result, curriculum is pitched too high for most students, making progress near to impossible. The result of all of this, I think, is that the foundations of our education systems across the world have been hollowed out. Learning is under threat, putting future generations at risk. I know I'm, I'm pessimistic. I'll come to something a bit more positive in a minute. <laughs> so, we're, and Stephen mentioned this, halfway to the deadline of achieving the SDGs by 2030, the stark reality is that learning poverty has reached alarming levels. Children are not gaining the vital foundational skills to building blocks of numeracy and literacy. And indeed, don't just take it from me. The state of the global education report in 2022 estimated that 70% of 10 year olds are unable to understand a simple written text. This figure rises to 89% in sub-Saharan Africa, where population growth is also outstripping our ability to provide schools, teachers, and materials. Put another way, only one child in 10 in sub-Saharan Africa leaves primary school able to read compared to nine out of 10 in OECD countries like the UK. That cannot be a state of the world in which we're willing to continue to tolerate. So this generation of students now risks losing $21 trillion in potential lifetime earnings the equivalent of 17% of today's global GDP. This is significantly up from the 17 trillion estimated in 2021. And so every day, every day, millions of children around the world are denied their basic rights to safe learning, safe quality learning. They're being failed by the education systems. And I hope you'll agree with me that this is unacceptable. We're losing entire generations of learners with disastrous lifelong implications for them, their communities, their societies, their countries, their economies. The scale and depth of the learning crisis with all its wider implications means that we cannot afford to tinker at the edges. We cannot afford to spend order and to spend aid and to deploy our diplomacy in a business as usual way. We can't act in isolation, I don't think, or just wait for solutions to appear or to wait for better times. I think that we need lasting transformational change on a massive scale if we are to meet the global challenges in education. We must invest in safe, quality, equitable education. We must invest early, collectively, innovatively, and we must start, I think, with the basics. Foundational learning or the basics are critical. To unlock the promise and the full potential <coughs> of a quality education, we need to give all children the basic foundational skills, literacy, numeracy, socio-emotional skills that they need to progress. These are the building blocks which will enable children to thrive in schools and throughout their lives. If children lose the first four to six years of their education, they miss out on those critical basic skills and higher levels of education, or higher levels of learning over the remaining six to eight years move out of reach. And we know that done well, foundational skills set children up for a life of learning and create the conditions for school systems to be able to deliver 
higher order skills, digital skills, scientific thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication skills, for example, skills which are so vital to thrive in this century. We know that what happens in early childhood, even before children start primary school, is crucial for securing foundational learning, particularly for vulnerable and marginalized children. I'm not, I, I suspect all of you in this room will probably remember your first day of pre-primary education or indeed a primary education. I certainly remember mine. My father took me to the preschool in our local community center in the village where I grew up in Trinidad uh, and handed me over to the woman who ran the school and her name was Miss Hathaway. I'll, I'll never forget her name. <laughs> this is decades later. So Miss Hathaway was the person. She ran this school in the community center. And the reason I was taken there is because my parents felt I was ready for school. Now in the Caribbean, and in Trinidad, school readiness, the measure, the indicator of school readiness was how chatty you were, how talkative you were. And for those of you in this room who know me, you'll probably know I was just born ready. <laughs> because I was chatty at that age and I'm still chatty now, uh, decades later. But, but more seriously, I suspect that my parents knew that these formative years, that in these formative years, the brain undergoes rapid growth making it sensitive period for learning. And they think that they also knew that adequate levels of nutrition and healthcare are essential from birth to support this process along with safe and a nurturing environment. This early period lays the foundation for cognitive, emotional and social development. And indeed, many of the wider gains from education rely on us giving children critical socio-emotional skills as well as the basic skills in literacy and numeracy. The social and emotional learning is such an important but often overlooked third dimension of foundational education. For all children, a supportive early learning environment fosters skills such as communication, collaboration, emotional intelligence. It helps to build a strong foundation for future academic pursuits and personal development contributing to empowered and confident individuals. And indeed, according to uh, Amina Mohammed, the Deputy uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Education must provide children with the tools and confidence that they need to realize their aspirations and contribute to their families, communities, and societies. She says that our children should be learning to learn, but must also be learning to live together, learning to do, and learning to be. The transformative impact of investing early goes beyond education. It can help to bring about the, that social transformation that Camford believes in, and certainly I also believe in and so passionate about. So as the UK's gender envoy, I would like to talk a little bit about one aspect of social transformation, and that's gender equality. Foundational learning we know, including socio-emotional skills and infused with the principles of equality and inclusivity has the power to challenge stereotypes and to foster a culture that recognizes and values the contributions of all individuals, regardless of gender. By instilling these values early on, we can break the cycle of inequality and shape future generations that view gender equality as a cornerstone of a just and progressive society. And we know that we only build a fairer, freer, safer, wealthier and greener world where everyone benefits and no one is left behind if we put women and girls at the heart of all of our efforts. We also know that when we invest in the foundations, there's a greater likelihood of retention and progression through the school system with an outsized impact for girls and the wider society. Those of you in this room, you know this. We know that a girl who stays in school is less like, is likely to have more choices, to earn more, to be more resilient to climate change, to have smaller, healthier, and better educated families. You know, the evidence is compelling. We, we, we bag that one, we know that. She's also less likely to experience violence now and in her future life. 
Education is a critical tool for dismantling the attitudes and behaviors rooted in gender inequality that perpetuate violence both against children and as well that perpetuates gender-based violence more broadly. It holds the potential to create a generation that rejects violence as a means of asserting power and control and centers equitable values. Over half of the world's children experience violence each year, with an estimated 60 million girls sexually assaulted on their journeys to and from school. 60 million girls. We must tackle the harmful social norms that sustain violence in our communities to ensure that education is accessible to all and that benefits are realized. Investing in girls' education has a positive impact on driving down the rates of child marriage, can contribute to reducing infant mortality and drastically reduces early childbearing, overcoming some of the main drivers of gender inequality. And the benefits of investing early for children extends to women's economic empowerment as well. In most parts of the world, including in this country, women still do the majority of childcare. More affordable, more accessible quality early years provision can only be a good thing. And for those women who want to work outside the home, it enables them to go back into the workplace and contribute to their household's income. We know that the, particularly in the pre-primary uh, sector, it tends to be dominated by women. We know that there's still a conversation to be had about working conditions, their pay, et cetera. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that one, I'm not putting it to one side, but we know it's an issue that needs to be addressed. But we know that supporting women into the labor market is also transformational. Working can enable women to build assets and save for economic security during their working lives and into old age. This gives women greater power and control over the decisions, their life decisions, including if and when to have children, what livelihood or career to choose, and how to plan their working life around these choices. So lots of bad news in the last 10 minutes or so, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> the good news is that today, more than ever, we know what works to transform education systems deliver foundational learning and improve children's learning outcomes, and so contribute to wider social transformation. The UK has been at the forefront of growing that evidence base, including through our flagship research programs. The now global smart buys for education tells us where we can make the best investments with our aid spending, for example, and where governments can make changes to the education systems using their vastly greater resources. For example, informing parents and communities of the benefits of education is transformative. Teaching children at their own level, not according to their age, is another. And providing teachers with well-structured teaching materials. We know this is what works. And so the FCGO is directing our investments based on this evidence. For example, a legacy of our work with Camford and other partners on the Girls' Education Challenge is a unique and comprehensive and accessible bank of learning uh, and resources to support future practice, policy, program design, and research on overcoming barriers to learning for the most marginalized and disadvantaged girls. And our new What Works Hub for Global Education will be entirely focused on ensuring that policymakers and decision makers in education systems around the world can access the rigorous evidence they need to make the right investments. And I think we've got a colleague here from the What Works Hub. But we also know that we need to look for and to learn from innovative approaches as well that are being developed and implemented to better prepare children to learn and particularly to build their socio-emotional skills. I just now we'll just talk a little bit about one of the a, a program that we are beginning to support in, in many parts of the world is run by an organization that's called Think Equal. And it's run by uh, so, someone called Leslie Udwin, who is now the CEO. She was previously uh, a filmmaker. And it's Think Equal program is an evidence based, holistic, socio emotional uh, learning program for children between the ages of three and six, providing educational resources and tools to achieve the outcomes of inclusion equality and well-being. Leslie talks very passionately about her work, particularly the work that she does in what she calls 
greatest Manchester rather than greater Manchester. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting because the work in, 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 that's been done by Think Equal in Manchester in this country is being funded by the Violence Reduction Unit. This is a program that's dealing with pre-primary education, but the recognition there is that if you start early, you start building those pro-social skills, then in fact, you will bank the benefits later on. In fact, she talks about the fact that the cost of the cost to run the program for 48,000 children over 10 years is, all, is equivalent to what we would pay to incarcerate one violent criminal. Yeah? So where do you put your investment? Early or you pick it up at the other end? And while there's an uplift in high quality research and evidence on what works to improve student learning outcomes in low income contexts, the priority now is to ensure that these interventions are embedded in government systems and implemented sustainably at scale to reach as many children as possible over the long term. We must also improve the effectiveness of what governments and donors already spend on education, which is an estimated $224 billion annually. But we know that the tightening fiscal space in donor and partner countries, combined with the existing uh, funding gap in the sector, means that the quality of education spending is perhaps more important than ever. For example, the FCGO has a suite of new programs that has been designed specifically to improve learning at scale. This includes supported, uh, supporting the uh, careful adaptation and optimization of education reforms and interventions for new contexts, and working together to address the technical and political barriers that challenge change. We've also sought out new and innovative ways in which to make every pound <coughs> count. And that's why, for example, we are one of the first contributors to the International uh, Financing Facility for Education, uh, which in its very first phase will unlock about $1 billion in new additional and affordable education finance for low middle income countries. But we can't do this alone. I can sit here and talk about and reel out for the next God knows how long what the UK is doing and what the FCDO is doing, but we can't do this alone. Of course, more and more effective investment is crucial, but money is not enough. We need to partner and to collaborate with other countries and organizations. And for the UK, this includes stepping up to lead the donor role on the SDG4 Education uh, High Level Committee, for example, representing other donors. It means coming together as we did last week, um, our Deputy Foreign Secretary, Andrew Mitchell, uh, brought together a number of uh, ministers of education from across Africa to talk about issues around uh, violence against children. And that will lead into uh, a ministerial uh, um, event in Colombia uh, later this year that's going to focus on violence against children. That's an event that's being uh, organized and being led by the World Health Organization. And the UK is also a founding member of uh, the Global Coalition for Foundational Learning, alongside UNICEF, UNESCO, USAID, the World Bank, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and more recently, the Global Partnership for Education. Recognizing the scale of the challenge, our seven global organizations are working closely together to support national policymakers dedicated to transforming learning in schools in governments across the globe. Our increased global focus on foundational learning is an important shift and provides the opportunity to ensure that all children, including the most marginalized and vulnerable girls and children with disabilities, achieve what they deserve from education. The coalition, and more importantly, our joint effort to so with so many governments around the world is indeed unprecedented. And I'm so excited, for example, to see the big focus within the Global Partnership for Education on foundational learning, and of course, the World Bank is part of that coalition, uh, and they're the biggest financier of basic education, something like $8 billion, uh, $8 billion portfolio. And this year is the year uh, of the African Union Year of Education. So as a coalition as well, we want to come behind that, working with Africa, African ministers of education, uh, and as well working with Human Capital Africa. 
but the momentum and the commitment from the policymakers and the heads of state that we are seeing to lead this response is really exciting. And because, the, because of the commitment we can see in terms of addressing the learning crisis on the continent. But we know that real progress is reliant on those leaders translating that positive energy and that commitment into tangible progress on the ground, securing and sustaining the political will needed to address the challenge of getting more children learning both quickly and at scale. And so working in coalition has been a real eye opener for us in a number of different ways. What we are recognizing, just a few things that are coming to the fore already, the need for more coherent investment. So how do we come together as major donors, major investors? How do we make that more coherent? Reducing the transactional costs on government. We've known this for years, but hopefully now we're beginning to, to do that better. We know that teachers need our full support. Many education systems invest less in early grade teaching than in higher levels of education. However, foundational learning skills are essential for future learning. We also know that we need to innovate, but to innovate wisely. So carefully designed education technology and other innovations have the potential to transform education systems where solutions are based on the individual country context and designed to complement proven approaches. So we, as the UK government, we will be out there fighting the fight as, 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 we, as we have over a number of years on this, and we will continue to do so. We can work with others, lots of efforts, um, global efforts and coming together, lots of energy we can see from uh, African governments and policy makers as well. But I guess just to end, what I, the question I want to pose to all of us is, is that enough, given the scale and the depth of the crisis that we are dealing with? Because millions of children are still entering school late and with limited school readiness. In many countries, children formally start school at age seven, or in many instances, coming later. And arrive at school without the socio-emotional skills, the motor skills, or the general knowledge needed to start learning. This is not surprising given the levels of poverty and marginalization in some parts of the world. And unfortunately, the children who need the support the most, those from poor communities exposed to violence, or with parents overstretched stretched or under stress, from dealing with economic, health, or climate-related interruptions are the ones least likely to benefit. And despite the strong evidence that early childhood development has high potential for impact, it is often underfunded, and there is more limited understanding of how to implement quality multi-sectoral early childhood development at scale. In fact, only 19%, 19, less than, less than a fifth of children in low-income countries have access to pre-primary education. And coverage is skewed towards those who are better off. Many services are provided in the private or the non-formal sector and are not properly regulated. And we know that once the, needs of once the seeds of inequality are sown, that they grow and expand as children move through the education system. So today what I've tried to do here is to sound the alarm on foundational learning and the foundational learning crisis and its implications. But quite frankly, you've probably heard some of this before. Others before me have sounded this alarm, and in fact, many more after me will do so. While we have made progress globally, I think that we need far more, far more traction on this. I'm not convinced that as a global community, we have woken up to the full impact now and for the future generations of the crisis in foundational learning. And the need for urgent action as well, and I'm sure we have woken up to that. Let's be honest, the political imperative tends to be focused on unemployed, disadvantaged youth, particularly young men. So how do we accelerate traction and action? Is it that the returns or the benefits of education are medium and long term? and don't overlap neatly with political cycles? Is that the challenge that we are facing? Is it that our messaging is off? Those of us like me, some of you in this audience possibly, civil society, researchers, think tanks, etc. is our messaging a bit off? Are we really tapping into what our partner governments are saying to us? What, what are their concerns? The newspaper headlines that concern them. The low levels of basic skills 
among the high levels of unemployed youth are in fact linked to inadequate foundational learning. So it's not, I don't think it's a zero sum game. <clears throat> they, they are linked. You're not going to get those outcomes that you want into secondary education, lower or indeed uh, higher secondary education, if in fact the foundations are not strong enough. So what, what's our messaging? What are we saying uh, to, to, to policymakers and to, and to our ministers of education? How do we support governments to embed results and outcomes orientation into education systems? How do we make it part of the DNA of these systems? How do we get internal accountability uh, into the systems? We tend to focus our attention on ministers of education and their senior officials. But are we getting through to the real decision makers, the heads of state, other ministries, the minister of finance, the ministries of finance, who within the system, who, where are the movers and shakers, who, where did this, does the decision making lie? And do we pay adequate attention to parliamentarians? Stephen talked about that earlier on. Do we pay adequate attention to parliamentarians, to parents or to the wider public? Each so important in demanding better education for our children and for holding government to account. What more could be done in that space? Or maybe part of the answer lies in us stepping back and reflecting about who leads the conversation with governments and stakeholders across the world. The FCDO's recently published International Development White Paper challenges us to rethink the very nature of our partnerships and relationships. Has the time come for us to genuinely, <clears throat> genuinely work to support, in support of locally and regionally led institutions that have more credibility and legitimacy in the context in which we work? And given the power of foundational learning to transform societal norms and to promote issues like gender equality, should we not be joining forces with women's rights organizations and movements, for example? Clearly the nature and the scale of the challenge that we're dealing with and the response that's needed mean that this can't be for the education sector alone. We must go beyond. So perhaps unhelpfully, I have posed more questions than proffered solutions. Our collective pursuit of foundational learning is not just an investment in education. It's an investment in the very fabric of our societies. And so by acting together, we can break the chains of learning poverty, advance gender equality, challenge social norms, and reduce violence against women and girls. But we need to invest, I think, early, collectively, wisely, and innovatively. We promised some time ago as a global community to leave no one behind. We should not, we must not, and I believe together we will not. Or as Camford, as a Camford motto suggests, this my Paul Shona is going to come in now. Pamboja <laughs> Tunaweza. In, in other words, together we can. Thank you very, very much. My name is Dr. Louisa Chiampi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Real Centre and have had the joy and honour of working alongside uh, the research on both of the projects that we're going to share with you today. Um, I am happy to kick off the research presentations uh, and to do this, um, I'm actually going to hand the presentations over to my two colleagues who I'll introduce shortly. So the Learner Guide program, and there's Camford people in the room who will know this a lot better than me, but the Learner Guide program has been operational in Tanzania for 11 years to support gender inequalities. Um, the Learner Guide program is a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring approach, which mainly uh, focuses on young women who themselves have been supported to be mentors in government secondary schools. These young women are called Learner Guides. Um, the Learner Guides deliver a life skills program called My Better World. So if you hear uh, that terminology, it's talking about the, the life skills program which they are delivering. Um, there's already a suite of evidence around uh, that shows the positive impact of the CAMPED program. Oh, thank you. Oh, I can show you my nice diagram now. <laughs> um, 
So here's the Learner Guide program. Uh, there's already a suite of evidence that shows the positive impact of the CAMBID program in retention and improving learning outcomes. Um, and so we've, we're building on this evidence. Um, so thank you, funded by the uh, IDRC KICKS and the Allen and Jill Gray Foundation, we are going to be sharing two of our presentations today which builds on this evidence. Um, our first presentation is going to look at uh, what the government is willing and able to scale up in terms of the Learner Guide program. And our second is looking at uh, the effect of the Learner Guide program within schools, but also beyond schools in terms of gender, in terms of shifting gender social norms. So um, without further ado, I'm very happy to invite my two fantastic research colleagues. Um, and the leads of the research project from the University of Dar es Salaam, Dr. Nkani Lekka and Dr. Rose Marie Maipopo. Um, please join me in welcoming them to their presentations. As introduced by uh, Dr. Louis Asiampi, I'm Kani Lekka Mgonda, working with the University of Dar es Salaam, the School of Education. And um, in this uh, research, I took the position of a researcher. So. I was there from the very beginning, uh, managing the processes of data collection and so on and so forth. So here I am to take you in the first part, and that is on the scaling, uh, scaling up the learner guide uh, program in Tanzania. Um, in this particular uh, part of our research, we actually aimed at gaining an understanding uh, if the learner guide program uh, under comfort is of interest to the um, Tanzania, uh, to Zambia and uh, Zimbabwe. And then we focus, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on what we found out uh, on the part of Tanzania. And uh, we wanted to identify the specific aspects. You know, Learner Guide has a, a number of components. And uh, now we wanted to, spe to specifically identify the aspects of the Learner Guide program that countries would want to adapt, adopt, and the pathways are uh, uh, to scale it up. Now, to do this, we had uh, the so-called uh, scaling advisory committee. Scaling advisory committee, we sometimes uh, abbreviate it as SAC. So when you hear me talk, talk of SAC, do not, be, um, do not get confused. I'm actually referring to these committees that we formulated. And this committee is actually, actually a committee per country. Um, were formed of the government officials uh, who could take part in exploring, identifying, and recommending specific elements of the program that could be adapted, uh, adopted, or scaled up. And uh, these were very, very important people to us during the research process because it composed of the relevant ministries, people from relevant ministries, as, a, as it will be indicated uh, soon. And these were identified by uh, Comfort. So we worked through a sustained engagement and interaction with this group uh, to get what we are going to present before you today. Specifically in Tanzania, we had uh, representatives or officials, officials from the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. This is the mother ministry uh, in charge of all education affairs in the country. Um, we also had uh, representatives uh, coming from the National uh, Technical Education Vocational Training. We also had uh, uh, um, representatives from the president's office, regional administrative and law government. This is the ministry in charge uh, responsible for the daily running of the schools. And uh, prime minister's office, labor youth, um, employment and persons with a disability, members from Tanzania Education Network. This is a, an NGO. Um, Tanzania Institute of Education in charge of issues of curriculum development and design of curriculum. Tanzania Institute of Adult Education, and some of the members are here represented, and um, district uh, officers. Now, as it, as it was introduced, the design of this study was more or less collaborative, and uh, we engaged very closely with these government officials in the stages of the research, and therefore, the design was built up with a number of uh, activities, uh, interviews, uh, uh, successful meetings, uh, a series of observations in schools to see what is happening, what the learner guide, how does the learner guide unfold 
uh, the practice of the Mebeta world, so that the government officers will also have a buy-in in what is happening, to get them, al get them along the processes that is happening in school, how are the learner guides, for, for example, uh, transforming the, 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 the realities of our education in schools. And um, then we had group discussion. So it was a, a participatory kind of research that took on board uh, every interesting members. So we had first, if you could see from the diagram, uh, we had interviews with the so-called uh, um, scaling and advisory members. And this meeting was uh, essential for introduction. It was an introductory meeting that we told them about what, the aim, what was the aim of the research, uh, the specific things that uh, the, the, the research aimed, and therefore they could, know, they could know what is happening. From this, we had a series of observations. Uh, we had three districts, and from this district, we picked the schools based on some criteria I'm going to show you. And they went in these uh, schools, observing what is happening. They could see for themselves what is happening and how the learner guides are doing. And after the observation, we convened again for another meeting. This was more or less um, a, reflectory, um, a reflective meeting to what they have observed. And uh, it was also laid down a foundation for what they would want to observe further in the, uh, uh, in, in the subsequent visits. And um, then we went and we, we had another, uh, another school visit. And this time we conducted a series of group discussions um, in-depth interviews with all the participants, the students, the parents, the teachers, the members of the uh, school governance, and so on and so forth. So that uh, the process of generation of, of data generation, uh, gathering of the compelling evidence was very much participatory. Thirdly, we had the, the SAC meeting or the, uh, the general SAC meeting, this is a national one, whereby we actually met with all the SAC members, those who were to the field, and the other uh, interesting partners from Comfort and researchers and make some important deliberations on what we saw, what could actually work, and the uh, particular workable scenarios that were presented, the dilemmas that we saw, and so on and so forth. We also had the regional meeting. This now was conducted in Lusaka, Zambia, whereby the uh, sterling and advisory committees from the three countries met, discussed a number of things, and chat out uh, solutions to what they saw, and made some recommendations. And we then conducted end of the uh, project interviews with the rest of the uh, scaling and advisory uh, committee members. So this was the methodology in short, and it was very, very uh, participatory. And these are the few, uh, these are the districts where we actually conducted the, our, our observation of the learner guide, uh, of the learner guide program, and specifically the observation of the My Better World uh, sessions in schools. And these schools were located in Iringa, for those who are familiar with Tanzania, as indicated in that map, uh, Iringa, Kibaha, as well as um, Ahandeni. And uh, we were interested in the mixed sex schools, so as we can have uh, the total experience of what is happening in schools. And also, uh, we, want, we, we aimed at the schools where the by better world decisions were timetabled and took place for some time. We considered three schools that had well-functioning I'm um, a better world programs or learner guide program and one school which had some difficulties in its implementation. Uh, now the findings. The following are the perspectives of alignment of the learner guide program with Tanzania national uh, priorities. The, I mean, seeing the importance of the, of the life skills and, and, and social emotional competence in the development and the success of learners, the Tanzania developed the National Life Skills uh, Framework in, two, in 2010. But later on, this aspect was given more importance by the, uh, the policy, educational policy of the country, which, was, which has just been reviewed. Still, there is a lot of emphasis that is coming up and recognition on the importance of guidance and counseling in making sure that the journey of the students to achieve whatever they want to achieve is a success. But also, this is something that we have seen and it aligns very, very well with the uh, learner guide program. But also the issue of soft skills development has been underlined and it is very, very important. Essentially, learner guide program or my, the My Better World program addresses that, it addresses soft skills. And this is what actually is picked up from our important documents, especially the five-year development plan, uh, which also underscores the importance of soft skills for learners' development. But also the issue of uh, improving access and participation of children and women 
is also uh, brought to the fore uh, in these, in these uh, national documents. Now, what do we found out in the course of this uh, uh, research? The specific priority aspects of the learner guide which are important to emulate or scale in the, in the national structures. The first one is on the peer-to-peer -peer kind of mentoring. Uh, learner guide program is built around peer-to-peer uh, -peer mentorship. The young girls are identified, but they work alongside with the students for them to achieve you know, their, 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 their educational goals and, and the learning. So this is one of the aspects that uh, is actually uh, works uh, seriously well to bring the results that we are seeing. And uh, it is important that peer-to-peer uh, -peer mentorship is maintained in order to make sure that uh, students find their partners who could speak, who could relate to, and could open their hearts to them and tell them uh, the challenges they encounter, and therefore be able to be advised or counseled to achieve their you know, life, lifetime goals. The other thing was the including life skills as taught through my better world. There are quite a number of lessons that teachers could confess that the learner guides are doing a wonderful job. So they were actually um, admiring that probably the methodologies that they are using, the kind of relationship they were able to build in school is something that is worth emulating. So including the skills taught through my better world program. The other thing was the spirit of giving back. These are the girls who are identified from the communities having gone through uh, same challenges, but they were able to overcome them. Now they are coming back to give back to their, you know, to their, uh, to their fellow, I'd say, to their, to, their, to their fellow students. And therefore, this is something that uh, was seen as very, very important and has to be uh, maintained. And uh, in, in a way, it builds the spirit of patriotism and sustainability in its, uh, in its uh, development. The next aspect is uh, the specific aspects that we need to consider further, or these are some of the aspects that uh, the, the, the SAC members were concerned about, and they probably they, they are worth uh, our second reflection. The first one is on the financial sustainability, to make sure that uh, the program, the Learner Guide program, is running schools. The government has its own priorities, and this is another thing, however important it might be, but we need to actually negotiate between and among the priorities that the government have to make to have it sustained. So financial stability is the first thing. The second thing is the, the need to further build the capacity of the learner guides uh, for them to be able to, um, um, to actually represent themselves as people who are actually able to do what they are expected to do. So there are discussions around building their pedagogical skills, for example, enhancing their financial and economic well-being through maybe prov provision of incentive so that they are able actually to work more happily and deliver what they expected to deliver. The third, as the third aspect is that one of expanding the My Better World lessons to primary, to primary, especially primary school, where some of these predicaments or challenges of, challenges of um, um, retention are also happening. Grade six, we have had cases where by grade six, uh, children or grade seven children um, getting out of the school because of pregnancy, early marriage, and so on and so forth. So it is important to build the capacity of the young ones right from their primary school age, and it's something that we also need to think about. But also, but also, but also it's also important to be aware of integrating this into standard academic uh, subject, and there is a danger that it might lose its trans transformative, uh, transformative nature. We, we we believe the transformative nature of the learner guide program. It's because of the way it is being provided right now. So it is very important not to disturb so much the ecology because uh, these are the young ones who are well versed with the environment. They are able to interact very harmoniously with the students. They are able to help them and rescue various situations that are facing them. So probably over uh, formalizing it may also uh, cause the model to lose its uh, um, a transformative power. The last aspect I'm going to speak is on the views of the government officials and opportunities to support the scaling up of the, uh, the learner guide program. The first one, there are also there was an indication that probably we need to leverage uh, ministries beyond the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. And here, the point on focus was uh, the need to include the Prime Minister's office, uh, labor, youth, uh, development, and um, and people and persons with a disability. This ministry has a specific allocation to deal with youth volunteering, uh, capacitating them, giving them some seed money to open some startups and be able to self-employ. So probably this is one of the scenarios that the SAC members saw 
that is important also to leverage uh, beyond the Ministry of Education that we can offer. The second one is the use of the local government, LGAs, which normally apportions around 10% of their um, local uh, earnings to support uh, women and youth development in the local government. So this is another scenario that was pointed out, and I think it's, it, it, it can be thought of. And uh, the other thing was the, if everything fails, the scaling and advisory committee say probably because we have teachers who are doing the guidance and counseling in schools, then we can probably allow teachers to hand over the learner guides role. Now, this one comes with inbuilt uh, uh, dangers, and I would like to point them out. The first one is that one of uh, that teachers, in most cases, has failed to maintain the, uh, the kind of horizontal relationship because of power relations. You know, it has been easy for the learner guides to interact very harmoniously with the students because they don't assume the power over the students, but the learner guides have been able to do that. Now, how do we recruit our teacher, for example, for example, baptize them to become learner guides before they can actually deliver the program? This is a question that we need to reflect. But again, there is a danger of losing the peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, uh, relationship that uh, has actually worked the magic in bringing the transformation. To continue, I would like to invite Dr. Rosa Moipo to take you through the impact study on the gender social norms. I'll present on um, our study in understanding the role of the Campbell Learner Guide Program in shifting gender social norms in Tanzania. And um, this was a study, yeah, this was a study that was done in collaboration with the University of Cambridge and University of Dar es Salaam as Pauline had introduced. And um, its uh, basic intention was actually to get um, ground-based, community-based evidence on the impact of the learner guide program. So this was a study that was participatory and community centered, but at least um, Cambridge and um, University of Dar es Salaam were involved in the designing of the research, but also in executing and supervising the research itself. Our research was um, based on um, a certain idea and understanding on uh, the existing gender social norms and these guided our research framework and we were informed by existing literature and we focused on uh, six i should say probably common gender social norms that were quite um, relevant in understanding areas of gender inequality in tanzania and uh, they are the, the decision making and leadership early marriage early pregnancy gender-based violence paid and unpaid work and education. And as you see, coming from even our keynote speaker, these are areas that uh, still have issues when it comes to gender inequality, and particularly the status of young girls in Tanzania. Um, our study design was uh, guided by three basic objectives, and from which we drew our three basic questions. One was on um, what gender social norms exist within the communities within which Camfed works. And as I said before, these gender social norms, we were initially informed by existing literature. There's a lot of evidence on uh, the rate and levels of teenage pregnancies, for example, dropouts and enrollment, but also differences in paid employment and some issues to do with GBV. And then um, our second objective and question was on who in the community did learner guides engage with to support the shift in gender in harmful gender social norms, as I said before, it was about getting the communities to explain about the impact of the learner guides, because that was their field of working and what evidence were they giving on the working of the learner guides. And finally, on um, learning how the learner guides themselves helped in shifting gender social norms. We use a range of participatory techniques, key informant interviews. These were focused mainly, mainly on um, policymakers at the national, but also at the district level stakeholder mapping and um, group discussions. We also focus on the learner guides themselves to give us their own experience on engaging, but also the way in which they thought they were making an impact on uh, the community level. Um, the study areas, we did our research in four districts in Tanzania, rural districts, and uh, the selection of those districts was based on a number of like, criteria, but key, was where did Camfed work more beyond, uh, I mean, beyond a minimum of five years, but also where from the literature we had learned that there was a, at least the prevalence of uh, 
gender inequalities comparatively, and all of these were rural locations. Well, I, I know we should admit that Comfort works in many more districts, but these were based on the literature that was there and uh, the existing gender inequalities from existing literature to give us a certain kind of background. And from these four districts, we also selected eight um, wards and for their communities in those uh, respective wards. Um, now the study findings. Um, one thing that was quite important was to understand that from the learner guides perspective themselves and the community, we could establish that the learner guides were quite uh, important or prominent in their work, not necessarily within the schools that they worked. As uh, my colleagues had said, learner guides came from certain secondary schools and were and could go back to the schools to initiate and engage with the learners about um, these harmful gender social norms. So the school was probably their comfort zone in one way, but they worked with a range of community groups. And for us, that was a plus because it showed that um, it was not necessarily simply working with the schools, but they would engage with um, village committees, school committees, even the local community development officers. And it was through that process where their messages of changing social gender norms was uh, also appreciated. So there was uh, quite an, an interesting way in which they could uh, show how grassroots engagement was actually a very, very important part of their work and establish their methodology in uh, shifting gender social norms. And um, then the other thing was on learning the learner guide about the learner guides themselves. These are young ladies who have been going through some mentoring processes themselves, but also through the process of engaging with the communities, they could actually even establish, they would attest to a transformation in themselves that made them even more capable in engaging on um, what they thought should be addressed as harmful gender social norms. One of the things that they attested in the dissemination seminars we had also, but also in the field, was uh, their sense of self-improvement as persons and the ability that made them more able, that gave them the confidence and motivation to deliver and to engage, which we thought was very, very powerful in uh, enabling them to be probably the change makers that they were intended to be. The other thing was also they would feel a certain sense of acceptance. And this was sometimes also coming from the communities themselves where they engaged with. They could be listened to, yes, from their school, but also beyond the community. And um, the fact that they could engage with a wider social network showed their interaction, their integration within that community, which was also positive. But finally also, and I'm very happy that the um, keynote um, speaker had mentioned, the learner guides were slowly becoming part of the leadership positions. Some of them were becoming not village leaders per se, but small letter tensor leaders, we call them, but also part of the school committees. And in that process, they were making a presence and challenging the idea of females becoming leaders. And probably someday Tanzania will have a prime minister from the <laughs> campaign process, learner guide process. And um, we also assessed the extent to which the learner guides change gender social norms. And we did this by just establishing what did the community respond? How did they respond on where they think the learner guides have made a much, a much more difference? One was um, the most important, the most significant was um, the way the learner guides had been able to impact on education, particularly informing and sensitizing, encouraging communities that uh, girls have a right to education the same way as boys have. And the other thing was on gender-based violence. Some of the things that we heard from the communities was uh, when learner guides could make interventions when they heard that there was something not going right. For example, a girl supposed to be getting married or when they see about, uh, they hear about uh, some violence against children, they would speak, if not speaking to the parents, but at least they would report them to the right authorities. And um, they were also sensitized about the right of women to work. And probably in a lesser way was to make a huge impact on early pregnancy, early marriage and decision making and leadership. This at the community level, but not to themselves in particular. And um, we also had a way of assessing so now what learner guides 
what what norms are the learner guides challenging one was this idea on education access to education and from the communities themselves these are some of the quotes we got for example community members actually attesting that uh, to a certain extent they've been able to change community's perspective that a girl has the right to education as a boy and this was through engaging with parents the other thing was on sensitizing about gender-based violence that was very prominent in many many of the communities we worked to in many in, uh, in several occasions but the other thing also was talking about um, reproductive health for example sex is taboo for example not to discuss it that openly the policymakers would know that but at least by engaging with young girls and young boys because they were it's integrating with young boys and girls telling them how they could actually negotiate about sex at that age and also the sensitizing on the idea about um, girls not uh, only when they reach puberty then they have uh, they are ready for marriage the other thing was also about uh, entering paid or unpaid work and the right of women to work but also with leadership and for them in many communities they were seen as uh, role models actually they were accepted as role models changing the idea that girls can't uh, engage i mean can't enter leadership positions now one thing that we have to admit is that this the learner guide have been attributed to a lot of changes within the community but at least it's not only the learner guide process tanzania has a lot of actors a lot of processes that also engage with um gender inequality the rights of children to education and some of the actors uh policy there's a lot of policy number of other role models ngos we have a lot of ngos we worked with aki elimo or tgnp the media also is also um uh, attributed to certain send, sending certain messages but also globalization people can engage with the media and uh, hear a number of other changes so these numbers we didn't do any quantitative survey but these numbers reflect on uh, how our participants were responding to the questions on what the learner guys can do now in terms of consideration uh, one thing that we can want we want to share is about um, in summary in general the communities where we worked with, whom we worked with, actually acknowledge that uh, there are certain shifts in gender social norms which are happening over time. It's a process, but they admit that um, the shifts require changes in other contexts, for example, policy reforms. So you have that intervention by learner guides, but it has to be supported with other contexts, governance from governance and legal structures. But also, there was this question that the learner guides are working in a context where they are part of the cultural context. So here you find a person that has been brought up and made to engineer or intervene or initiate changes in a community that has brought her up. That was quite a, a challenge. But the other thing about lacking confidence, themselves as learner guides, they mentioned that, but also sometimes they feel that they are probably not very ready to confront certain issues like early pregnancy like child marriage but the other thing was that um, there were some partners some um, operators that were that could attest more to the learner guide influence more than the others and some were religious and traditional leaders which we are not so much surprised because um, in some ways some traditional leaders who actually uphold traditions would be probably less able or less ready to support the learner guide pro program and the other thing was on uh, as my colleague said not everyone in the communities would listen to the learner guides sometimes because of the perceived idea of lack of qualifications these were simply most of them were secondary school girls and some didn't probably have a gender equity whatever quality education but so there would be uh, some attitude at i mean uh, related to that but also them being simply volunteers they're not employed some have been employed yes but most of them were simply not employed so that had an attitude in the community in summary therefore what are we trying to bring to the audience <laughs> linking from uh, <laughs> Nkani and um, the study here was that um, it has been proven we have ground truthing ground evidence that the learner guide program is contextually relevant it has a lot to do 
has a lot of linkages with the priorities of the government, particularly the rights of the girl child, but also in education and the transformative aspect. And also because the government already is uh, supportive of it being um, adopted and uh, scaled up through the education system. And uh, it was also evident that uh, the Lena Guide program, its benefits can be felt beyond the school itself. And therefore, it can be used as a very powerful model, a powerful process, powerful methodology in contributing to transformative education that has that implication on gender equality and within the whole national policy environment. Thank you for participating. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fiona Mavinga. I am privileged to be standing here as both a founding member of the Comfort Association, which brings together all the graduates supported by Comfort through secondary school into an association now numbering over 279,000. And I'm also... <laughs> Thank you. And I hold the position of executive director for this association's development. So this um, earlier today, we heard how challenging, harmful and persisting social norms is by no means a mean feat. It takes an acute understanding of the nuances, the maneuvers and various money nations that social norms harmful social norms take to evade being confronted and maintain a stronghold. We heard how young women are rising to the challenge in the most marginalized of communities, armed with training and acute knowledge of the nature of such norms. They are putting themselves on the front line to champion access to education, girls' retention in school and completion rates, as well as driving up education outcomes for the most marginalized. We also heard from the researchers how beyond education, the learner guide model is challenging wider harmful social gender norms with researchers finding that they were contributing to a broader gradual shift in attitudes towards women in communities where women's interests have been considered secondary to those of men. Lena guide's presence on the ground within their communities is catalyzing positive change. As well as acting as mentors, they've become advocates who challenge harmful social practices and role models who embody a more positive future for women. They were also perceived as models of how women, even from challenging backgrounds, could be financially independent and therefore have increased autonomy over their lives, contributing to shifts in gendered job roles by successfully engaging in jobs considered traditionally for men. And speaking for engaging in jobs traditionally considered for men, it is my honor and privilege to introduce <laughs> our next speaker. <laughs> An esteemed leader who defies all odds to rise to the position of Prime Minister of the Government of Australia. I'm sure I am speaking on fact if I say that she acutely understands how much women go to just about move the needle for women's leadership. She is now championing education for all, as well as working to address the underrepresentation of women in leadership. And we all know that women's leadership is key to system transformation. She is the founding chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, and ladies and gentlemen, I present to you someone who has been a personal inspiration to me and also to my sisters in the Comfort Association, as well as to women globally, Julia Gillard. It's been terrific to be amongst you and to get to meet friends from the global education community and particularly from Camfed and to spend some time with Lucy, with Fiona, with Pauline, with Alicia, with so many people, Stephen, so many people who continue to make such a remarkable contribution to the global education community and particularly to girls' education. 
So thank you one and all for being here and online. I know that there are many gifted researchers and activists all brought together by this event. And of course, I am proud to be patron of CAMFED and I genuinely do believe educating girls is the foundation of achieving gender equality, promoting women into positions of leadership and ultimately finding a more peaceful, sustainable, equitable and prosperous future for our world. Today, I wanna to help us lift our eyes so that we can connect the important discussions on girls' education happening today with our ambition for a better future. And I'm gonna do that dreadful thing of leaving you with some challenges to think about, and then I'm gonna run out of the room because <laughs> I've got a commitment in London uh, that I need to make, which uh, was booked in before this event. Uh, so hopefully you can think about the challenges. And certainly if you see me fly past you and I'm not carrying my jacket or my handbag, do stop me and make me come back and grab them because that'll end badly when I get to London. Um, but uh, on to the statistics, and I wish I could tell you uh, what I'm going to share with you now is a whole lot of happy news, but that's not the case. I'm actually going to start with a depressing reminder of just how far we have to go to achieve gender equality. As many of you in the room know, each year the World Economic Forum provides a comprehensive measure of progress on the position of women across four domains, education, economic empowerment, health and political leadership. And the 2023 report tells us that in the 146 countries included in the index, the gender gap is now closed 68.4%. So there's basically a more than 30% gap to still go. Obviously, the result varies wildly from country to country and the countries in which CAMFED works and is focused tend to have a greater journey of change in front of them than that globalised statistic. But rather than working our way through the country differentials, what I want to do is cite our gaze on the rate of change. Looking at the 102 countries covered continuously in the index from 2006 to 2023, so that's getting on to being the best part of 20 years, the gap is 68.6% closed. However, the rate at which the gap has closed over those almost 20 years is glacial. Since the first edition of the report in 2006 to the most recent edition, the gap has only closed by 4.1 percentage points. That and the wide differentials between countries lead the report's analysis to conclude that at the current rate of progress, it will take 131 years to reach full gender parity globally. Now do let that just sink in for a beat, 131 years. Now to get a bit more granular, in my former world, the world of politics, the estimate is that it will take 47 years to achieve equal representation in national parliaments. And we need to remind ourselves that's not leadership positions, prime ministers, key cabinet ministers, those sorts of things. That's the people who are in the parliament. The pace of change in the biggest build businesses in the world is slower. In 2018, a FTSE 100 CEO was more likely to be named Dave or David than be a woman. The good news is there's been progress, but only just. Raconteur published their CEO index looking at the FTSE 100 as it stood at the start of the last financial year. Tracking the changes in that list, we can see we have crossed a threshold. There are more women chief execs than Daves and Davids, or Steves, Stevens and Stefans, but not more than the two combined. Last, la last time I used that statistic, a pregnant woman said to me after, I'm going to, I know I'm having a girl and I'm going to name my daughter Dave. So uh, 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 all, all sorts of things happen when you share these statistics. Um, obviously, this rate of change is maddening and we all want to know how to turbocharge progress. 
at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which I chair and which is cited at King's College London, <coughs> as well as at the Australian National University in Canberra in Australia, in partnership with the global polling company Ipsos, we take the view that to make change, we need to understand community attitudes. That's why each year around International Women's Day, we release global research on attitudes to gender equality. This research, um, this year's research was conducted with almost 25,000 respondents in 31 countries. I have to confess the only country from Africa included was South Africa, and I will break out its results as I go. But we did have wide inclusion from uh, Asia, from South America, from Europe, from North America, and of course, from Australia. But let me take you to the global finding first and spoiler alert, the news from this research is not heartening. It shows that 51% of respondents believe men are being asked to do too much to support gender equality, with 46% believing that we have gone so far in promoting women's equality that we are discriminating against men. The gender split in these figures is fascinating. On men being asked to do too much, 58% of men agree with that statement compared to 45% of women. And on women's equality having gone too far, the split is 53% men and 39% women. The South African results are in line with this global average with 55% saying men are being asked to do too much, but the South African results are significantly higher on the question, have we gone so far that men are being discriminated against? The result there is 57%, the fourth highest after Thailand, India and Mexico. Now that men would disproportionately say they are being asked to do too much or they are now being picked on is predictable, I would suggest. What is less predictable is the gap in the attitudes of young people. A full 60% of Gen Z men, that's men aged 18 to 27 in our, our sample, say that women's equality has gone too far. 60% of men aged 18 to 27. That's more than boomers who are aged over 60, more than Gen X who are in their mid 40s to late 50s, and more than millennials who are in their late 20s to early 40s. In fact, boomers come out of this the best with only 43% saying women's equality has gone too far. Gen Z and millennials are also more than twice as likely to agree that a man who stays home to look after his children is less of a man than boomers. So to the other boomers in this room, feel free to get these statistics out next time you're mocked with an okay boomer by a young person. But more seriously and sadly, I would also note that the trend line on gender equality in these questionnaires is disturbing and we can see a trend now because we've partnered with Ipsos for five years. And in that time, the percentage of people globally saying things have gone far enough in my country on gender equality has risen sharply from 41% to 53%. So that's a trend, that's not within the statistical noise margin of error, that's a trend. Now two questions confront us when looking at these results. First, why is the project of gender equality losing ground in public estimation? And second, what is going on with young men? On the first, the quick analysis usually given is that families who feel cost of living pressures today don't have the bandwidth to embrace big change projects. Instead, they are just flat out trying to look after the home front. And there's merit in that view. As the US moves to its election at the end of this year, consumer sentiment is falling and corporate results show people are spending less at Starbucks, McDonald's and on theme park holidays like going to Disneyland. Basically, the small luxuries that families usually enjoy have become out of reach. 
Here in the UK, as we also move to an election, 75% of Britons have said in a poll that they believe the economy is doing poorly. However, whilst cost of living pressures are part of the explanation, I think that there are many deeper factors at work. I think these are best summarised as a persistent sense that life is spinning out of control. This is felt deeply by many people that their life, life generally, is spinning out of control. And it's spinning out of control because of the relentless pace of technological change, geopolitical insecurity, rapidly changing cultural norms around gender, gender identity, race and interpretations of history, and chaos at many national borders, and the list goes on. And of course, we can't forget that elements in this mix are the aftershocks of the pandemic and the polarising influence of social media. All of this, and we will all have our own views about these issues, but I'm just bracketing them together to try and capture what I think are the factors spinning around families, individuals in so many countries and feeding into their attitude formation on gender equality. I think all of this has led to fatigue and a loss of faith in the future. We are seeing a trend down in people's belief that their children will get to live a better life than they did. And once the sense of social solidarity that we are building a better future together gives way, then the ability to get people to accept big change programs, I think, is hugely jeopardised. We are more likely to buy in collectively to say, let's all put our shoulders to the wheel if we've got a shared sense that we're building a better tomorrow for children, grandchildren, whether they're your own children, someone in your family, or you just care about the next generation. I think that binds people into big reform projects. If that belief in the future being better breaks down, then it's much harder to get people to buy in. Having said that, it would be naive of us to think all of these emotions were arising spontaneously. In many parts of the world and online, they are being deliberately stoked in culture war style dialogues. There are media outlets and politicians whose model of action are rooted in making people feel afraid and making inclusion policies seem harmful. This is hitting home in the US where it is now being routinely reported in the financial press that companies are moving away from discussing diversity, equity and inclusion in their annual reports and are cutting back efforts in these areas. The motive for some may be purely economic that, however unwisely, they have decided to reduce costs on things they might identify as nice to have rather than core business. But there is no doubt that the motive for many is about avoiding litigation with there now being a vibrant industry in suing companies around their diversity initiatives. To take one case as an example, Comcast in 2020 had a small business grant program called RISE, Representation, Investment, Strength and Empowerment, specifically targeted for businesses led by African-Americans. Now the RISE program is for all entrepreneurs. The change came in 2022 and it came because Comcast was sued by an anti-diversity equity inclusion group that alleged the program discriminated unfairly against Americans who are not African Americans. In a similar move, Goldman Sachs opened up its Possibility Summit for black college students to include white students. Politically, Donald Trump's allies have been saying if he returns to the White House, he will change the government's interpretation of civil rights era laws to focus on anti-white racism rather than discrimination against people of colour. At the same time this politics of fear and backlash are manifesting, there seem to be some very particular sites of pressure on young people, especially young men. While we do not have the deep research base needed to understand all of the factors at play. 
a combination of early access to violent pornography in many places around the world. And if you want to look on um, for the statistics around that, there are statistics, truly um, uh, distressing statistics about how many 10 year olds have seen violent pornography. So early access to violent pornography and the impact of misogynist online influences. These two seem to be leading to a retrenchment in the attitudes towards gender equality of a segment of young men. We intuitively think that, but we don't have the deep research base to show it yet. And polling does show that there's never been a bigger gap between political attitudes based on the gender of people in the, the inner generation than young people today. Put simply, young women are far more progressive than young men and the split in political attitudes between young men and one young women is at an all time high. Normally, if you see a generational effect in political attitudes, it tends to affect all members of the generation. For example, uh, the generation that came of age in those countries that had conscription for the Vietnam War, like Australia did, their early political attitudes tended to be forged around that experience of the Vietnam War, the demonstrations against the Vietnam War. And so they emerge into their voting, um, having shared an experience that shaped their attitudes. What we're seeing now, of course, is that young women and young men are clearly not sharing the same experiences shaping their attitudes because their attitudes are so different. So what can we do to counteract the many factors at play, which are degrading our ability to address big change projects, including gender inequality? Now, I truly wish I had every answer at my fingertips. Let me assure you, I truly wish that, but I don't. But let me venture some perspectives. First, gender equality and many other big reform projects that require community consent and social solidarity to actually do something for gender equality. It's not necessarily just about tackling gender equality as an issue on its own. In fact, the more we can address the other issues that are undermining people's sense of security, their economic position, the lack of services available to them, their sense of home and harmony, the more space we will create for bigger changes. That means that policies which create growth and good jobs, clean energy, green manufacturing, other forms of economic development, together with reforms to improve healthcare, so people are confident that they and their families will be cared for if they need assistance, uh, measures to improve government schools so that families are confident their children or grandchildren are getting a good education, managing migration and community integration. All of these are vital to the prospects of change, to building that social solidarity which matters so much. Second, I believe we need to ensure that we embrace rather than alienate. With the benefit of hindsight, I can clearly see that our arguments for gender equality have not been as inclusive as they should have been of all of the reasons that gen a gender equal society will be better for men. Um, you know, across, I've been at the business of feminist campaigning for several decades now, uh, many, 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 many years. And uh, across those decades of campaigning, we have uh, focused on saying where the gender barriers are, what we need to do to get rid of those gender barriers. Uh, we've painted a very good picture, I think, of why that will be better for women, but we have been less attentive to painting the picture about why it will also be better for men. And sitting in in the last session on research, I was um, very uh, heartened to hear how the learner guides experience is working on attitudes for boys and girls. That kind of inclusion is exactly what I'm talking about. Third, I think legislative creativity at the national level and increased cooperation at the international level is needed in order for us to be very forward leaning on social media regulation. We can't just keep accepting that misogyny, violent pornography, fragmentation and fury are now simply part and parcel of modern life. The to-do list is obviously far longer, 
but I think these would be three good places to start. So let me conclude with the challenge as I run out the room, a challenge to those who so passionately care about <laughs> girls' education. Of course, we must continue the work to the best of our abilities, fueled by the evidence that enables us to make the most change as quickly as possible. We must continue CAMFED's work, which has been nurtured over decades now to be the great organisation it is with its huge impact and change making uh, in so many places around the world. And it's a tribute to everybody who's been involved in, on the journey, but I would particularly like to single out Lucy Lake for her leadership. But even as we continue the work, we need to consider how better to explain our mission for girls' education, but more broadly for gender equality. We need to consider how better to explain it to the community in general and specifically to men and boys, because if we don't include them in the project of change, I am fearful that the results that I've brought, brought you today are just the tip of the iceberg and year after year uh, organisations like the Global Institute for Women's Leadership will do polling and we will inexorably see the trend line down on community attitudes and particularly boys and men's attitudes on gender equality. Now I know that won't be easy, I'm throwing a challenge down that isn't an easy one. But I absolutely know about the CAMFED community uh, gathered in this room and beyond that it has shown time and time again that it is able to make what seems almost impossible happen. Courage and ambition are always CAMFED watchwords. And so in that spirit, I really wish you all the best for the discussion to come. Thank you. My name is Lydia Wilbad. I am the Executive Director, Learning and Engagement, CAMFED International, based in Tanzania. One of the founding members of CAMFED Association members in Tanzania. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? Raise your hand if you can see me. Sally, can you see me? <laughs> Uh, I am excited to be bringing to you uh, the wonderful panelists who are going to bring things into perspective. Yeah? So I will be joined by my colleagues from Tanzania and from Cambridge. And uh, allow me to bring them um, on the floor. Uh, the first one is uh, Mr. Lawrence uh, John Sanga, the active um, acting assistant director in the policy research innovation section of the policy and planning department from the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Tanzania. A round of applause. And you know that feelings when you are with the, your government people, eh? you feel more important. <laughs> and even your inner power grows up. <laughs> Let me also bring uh, to the fore Dr. Sempeo Siaf, who is the Director of Academics, Tanzania Institute of Education, of Adult Education, and a senior lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam, founder, uh, and national founder of the National Guidelines for Integrated Program for Out of School uh, Children, the famous IPOSA program under the Ministry of Education, and um, a supervisor for reentry program in Tanzania from the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sempel, for joining us. And here comes Anna Sawaki. Anna Sawaki is the Director for Programs and Partnership, Comfort Tanzania. She is at the core of the business that we have been talking from the beginning. Eh? 
So these researchers, whatever they had to bring about um, to the audience, it is co-created and co-developed and led by, by, by Anna representing the team from Tanzania. <laughs> and then, the last but not least, our dear Mitali, I can't pronounce the <laughs> second name. Erzinski. <laughs> uh, Mitali is an associate director, partnership and advocates at the Co Impact. <laughs> so, together, this amazing panel is going to bring to you. Um, we hope that they will help you gain a deep understanding and the insights on the system change. You know, from theory to practice, eh? Eh, some of us uh, know the definition of system change from Google, from papers, mm -hmm. but now these people are going to bring the practical part of system change. And we are hoping that they will, within system change, they will also bring to life the co-creation model that has worked uh, in the partnership with Comfort and the Ministry of Education and how that co-creation can actually help the system transformation at different levels from the community, school, district, and national level. And most specifically, we are hoping that they will share experience on how the government uh, partners with the CSO such as Comfort to achieve system transformation. And also that they will bring into life the co-creation model on how it works in practice uh, to be able to achieve the progress that we have seen uh, presented today and also provide the insights on how the learner guide program is acting as a catalyst for system transformation. Just to bring things on perspective, uh, some of you know Comfort and uh, over the past three decades, Comfort Vision has been a world in which every child is educated. Please underline the word every child. Okay? Every child is educated, protected, respected, and valued, and grows up to turn the tide of poverty. And uh, Comfort Vision uh, for the system change is where the girls from marginalized background are able to enroll and complete secondary school and join the pipeline of women leaders at every level of the society, who in turn can ensure the system works even better for future girls. Because of the statistics that is out there, only 5% of the girls from the most marginalized community complete secondary school. So comfort vision for the system is where it can work best for the most marginalized children because evidence shows if the system works better for the most marginalized girl, it can actually work for each and every child. So over the next uh, decade, Comfort is intentional at uh, looking at the system transformation, not just direct uh, implementation, but tracking the progress of what is changing out of the contribution that Comfort is bringing on the table. And that brings us to the deliberate and intentionality in terms of partnership with the government. And here with me is the government of, um, from Tanzania, government people from Tanzania. And uh, some of the key achievement comfort and vision to achieve is one, completion rate, improving the completion rate for the most marginalized children, but also uh, dismantling some of the of the policies that undermine the right for education for girls, uh, for example, early marriage, and uh, you know, promoting some of the implementation of the policies, which are already there, but you know, the gaps is still on the implementation, like the reentry policy, that is very famous in in, in most of uh, some of our African countries, but the implementation is still uh, lagging behind. And we intend to leverage on the alumni network. Fiona mentioned uh, as a founding member of uh, Young Women Network supported through School by Comfort, which is now uh, totaling to 279,000 across 
five African countries, and just to mention for Tanzania is above 55,000 55, young women. So we intentionally aim to leverage and catalyze on the people that are already connected with deep passion to be able to see the change within themselves and within their communities. These are where we draw learner guides from. And we also uh, intentionally aim to leverage from our long-term uh, relationship with the government and the communities that we have built over time. And our approach is taking a co-creation model, which uh, panelists are going to, to talk through on how this works. A co-creation model uh, that aims to bring the partners from government and key stakeholders, including communities and young people, and uh, the model has worked effectively in practical sense and has enabled our strong relationship and partnership with government and communities where we work. And the evidence we have, we have seen it very effective to, to, to be able to, to work together in the research agenda like uh, researchers were presenting, not just coming to the government with uh, you know, findings for them to use, but intentionally including them as partners, even as we co-create the research. So without further ado, I am going to turn it to my panelists and uh, I'm just going to go through some questions for them to react. And for this, I'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lawrence. So, uh, Mr. Lawrence, we understand that to be able to have a, a strong partnership and collaboration, we need to build on trust. So, uh, can you highlight uh, what does it take to build the trust between government and Comfort to work in partnership together and adapt to the co-creation model? Thank you very much, moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, trust, as you, as you, you underline, is a two-way trafficking. It's between the government on one side and, 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 and the partner on the other side. And uh, there are a number of the combination of factors which, are, which are, can, can, can build the trust. One of them could be communication. We need to communicate to have a mutual understanding so that um, the government understands what the, the particular CSCOs or the development partners is intending to do and the partners also understand the role of the government in terms of the prioritizing what the government is intent to do. Otherwise, if, if, if that's it's not, it's not working, then uh, the trust will not be there. But also needed to understand the shared goals. That is, both, both, both parts should have the common goal of, of the, the inventions where direction is trying to achieve. For instance, those who are working in the education industry or in education settings, our key employer is a learner. So if our key employer is a learner, then all of us, we are focused on learners. So we'll have the same similar directions and that's bring the trust, okay. Why are we quarreling since all of us, we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are here to serve the right of our employer, a learner. So that also bring another trust between our, ourselves. So the similar uh, comfort as COCOs needed to and among the other CSOs in the country, and including even the partners, build the same synergy of understanding what the government wanted to achieve in terms of the uh, involvement. We, we, we involve them in, in, in the process, and also the government, the country involve the, the government officials in, in the process. That's why we're here. Otherwise, we could not be here because the company could come alone without the government officials. This is a, one another a good example of the evidence that now we are witnesses. So we know how what is government comfort is doing in terms of the research findings and what the, mm. the implication of the police. So it's easier for us as the government officials to, to, to take on board some of the recommendation coming in from the, this research as comfort is doing. This is a, another good insight of the, the trust which we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are working. But more importantly, in this um, formulation of the trust is the results. Whatever you are doing, you can have a good understanding in terms of the communication, you have good sharing in terms of the objectives, but if you are not producing the results, expect the result the government want to achieve, that became come a challenge in terms of trusting among ourselves. So, for instance, I can share them a good example. 
the government of Tanzania is committed to ensure that all learners get the, all children get the right to education, particularly universal education, basic education. That is mile, a, a, a great milestone of the country. No one is left behind. So wherever support, wherever CSOs, wherever NGOs in line to support that mission of the country, Yes, we are almost having the same sharing the common goals. We're on the same track. And uh, what Comfort is doing now is supporting the same. For us, we will see from the, from, the, from the finding, from the research. One of them is um, support the learner guide, engage the community. What, what is doing the community is support the community in terms of improving the access, particularly for the marginalized group. What, what we've seen from there is improve the retention. And all of us, we know the role of the community because the children are coming from the community. So if community are not involved, it means they will hide their children. They will not allow them to attend and uh, will not contrastize from what they are coming from. So in this case, involving youth from the locality, that is a sign of the engagement of the community. It's a strong uh, kind of the evidence for the government to trust that this one will help the government to achieve the, the policy of the fee-free education where in removing the all, all barriers and social and background, we're aiming to attain to ensure that everybody is, 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 is taking the right to education. So this is, in, in summary, uh, in shortly, I can say that that could be, we have to have mutual understanding, share common goals, but to show the evidence of the result, proven that without the doubt, okay, this is now, if we embed and we get support, create a conducive environment for to work with them will achieve. So we take the comfort as complementing the government efforts rather than activists to the government missions. Thank you. That's powerful, uh, uh, Mr. Rollins, and coming from the government themselves. So shared goal, obviously the evidence of result and complementarity to the mission that the government is aiming to achieve. Anna, on your perspective as Comfort, as CSCO, what does it take for you to build a, a mutual trust with the government? Sure. Um, Mr. Sang has said um, a lot from, from the government perspective. And I would say um, one uh, of other thing that has made uh, Comfort among the CSCOs get trust with the government is um, in the approach to work, the way uh, Comfort um, works from the structures of implementation from the national level to the to the school level at all levels we make sure that um, we have government on board for both uh, technical support and uh, advisory support for instance uh, our governing bodies also including uh, the ministry level directors as part of the of the board members to make sure that um, all that is happening in the program is also aligning with the, with the government priorities, as Sangha was saying. But again, we have a national advisory uh, committee, which um, is sitting to advise on the way forward. Like um, the technical team will do the technical aspects, and then we have the advisory board to, to let us know this is uh, how we do, and this is the, uh, the key entries to the, to the government. But again, um, at the district level, we have the district, uh, we have the government uh, district committee, which is overseeing the program implementation from the school level to the, to the district level to make sure that um, we have the quality education provided, including the life skills that is provided by the, the learner guides. But again, the, the relationship between the learner guides, our facilitators and the teachers, uh, but also um, the, the quality assurance aspect of the program that are implemented uh, by, by Comfort, same as to the level of the, of the schools where we have an uh, aspect of monitoring to make sure that um, the program is delivered of the quality and as per the standard of the, of the government where we have the word education officers, uh, the teachers and the head of school. So you could see uh, the trust does not start from there. It starts from the, the structures you have put in place to make sure that your partner, in this case, the government, is fully aware of what you are doing. So 
at all levels that you go to schools, the head of schools, the teachers will tell you what Comfort is doing. You go to the district level, the government district officials will tell you what Comfort is doing. You go to the national level, the ministry level will tell you what the, um, the government is doing, I mean, the Comfort is doing. So that way, it's not a surprise when you hear about Comfort Wake. It's not a surprise that uh, you are hearing about the findings of this certain research, but rather they will hear about the, the findings of what we have created together. So that's why it has also built um, a good trust to the government, among other, other CSOs. Thank you very much, Anna. So um, the work is built within and integrated uh, within the government system and the structures from the beginning. So to you, Mitali, uh, we understand that um, co-impact put collaboration at the heart of its approach. Mm -hmm. And so can you provide us with some insights into how uh, co-impact to think about collaboration in the context of system change or system transformation? Thank you, Lydia. Uh, thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. Mm -hmm. um, in full transparency, co-impact is a supporter of Camfed, proud supporter of Camfed. Um, but from speaking to people uh, over lunch, I know that many people in the room probably have no idea who Co-Impact mm -hmm. is. Um, so Co-Impact uh, was created just under seven years ago now uh, by our founder, uh, Olivia Leland, and collaboration was really at the heart of that. We bring together local change makers who are deeply rooted within the context such as CAMFED, together with philanthropists and funders from around the world to improve the systems of health, education, and economic opportunity. Uh, and we do this by pooling funding across funders to provide large-scale flexible grant funding with the aim of deploying a billion dollars for gender equality by 2030. So Co-Impact was born out of the belief that the complex, most complex problems facing the world today and the root causes that underlie exclusion and inequality cannot be addressed on our own and in isolation and working as single funding organizations and single implementing organizations. Um, so there needs to be a radical change in the way that we work mm -hmm. and that includes who we fund, what we fund, um, and also uh, how we work together as funders. Uh, so to achieve impact at scale, uh, to achieve systems change, we need collaboration between funders, but also mm -hmm. trust and partnership between funders and program partners. And we put program partners at the center and heart of what we do. And then we also need partnership and collaboration within the system itself, especially between implementing partners and governments. So we think about systems change both on the programmatic side and also on the funding side. Um, there are three things I wanted to call out, which I think have been demonstrated beautifully throughout the day, to be honest. And, and that is just that for systems change to be successful, we need to work in coalition and in partnership. Most systems, such as education, uh, are government ones, and even market systems are heavily influenced by government. So collaboration and coalition with government is essential. And as part of our approach, we make the sp space and resource available for our partners, and maybe Anna, you can speak to yeah. this, um, to go through what we call a design phase, um, which allows partners to have the time and space to reflect on their strategic initiative and their plans to undertake deep political economy analysis and ecosystem mapping and to think about what the right coalition is for mm -hmm. success. The second one is shared vision and shared action, uh, which I think my colleagues here have already spoken about, but without that shared understanding of what the problem is we're trying to solve and the buy-in and integration of what we're trying to do, I think systems change just becomes that mm -hmm. much harder and it must be government owned and yeah, government sure. champion. And then the final thing is we need collective reflection. I was so pleased to see the research earlier. Mm -hmm. I think we need collaboration and space to learn on what works for systems change, what doesn't work, and how you respond to the system as it changes for the longer term to sustain the impact um, that we want to see. And that's only possible through collective reflection. On the funder side, because I think it's not just about the programmatic side. So 
we've heard that funding is so often fragmented and we've been asked the question a couple of times today what can we do about it we need more funding mm -hmm. we need funders to come together um, we know that the anti-rights movements are so well funded and they're funded in an unrestricted way so we need funders to come together to date we've brought together 24 funding partners mm. we're almost halfway to our billion dollar mm. goal Thank you. And we need to fund root causes. I think too often we see funders funding um, single issue verticals or funding for the symptoms of the problems rather than actually addressing the root causes. Um, and we also advocate very much for trust-based funding. So as a funder, we do not say to Comfort, this is what we think you should do. This is what's going to work in, in Tanzania. I'm in the UK, but this is what's going to work. Uh, we very much encourage program partners to tell us, based on their deep contextual knowledge, what will work in that context, and also how best to measure it and what learning measurement and um, research and reporting approach to take that will help the partner to be able to deliver uh, a sustainable systems change initiative. Um, and then finally, funding has to be long term, flexible mm -hmm. and provided at scale. CAMFED have been at this for over a decade. Yeah. Most funding is one to three years. Mm -hmm. So we need as funders to start funding for the longer term and really focusing on that large scale funding to allow partners to pivot as things change within the system and to fail and to learn and mm -hmm. to adapt and iterate. Um, so those are the things I wanted to say about collaboration and systems change. Thank you very much, Mithari, for those insights on the uh, donor side. And so, um, Dr. Sempeo, obviously our approach, uh, we, we were talking about this of co-creation with partners, government and communities. And uh, this is also built under trust and uh, through collaboration. So can you highlight your experience of being part of the co-creation uh, team in Tanzania and uh, what ways does the co-creation model support the government in achieving system transformation goals? Can yeah, so my thank you Lydia for a very nice question and uh, colleagues I will really say um, that uh, um, I came to know a comfort first of all after joining the Institute for Education where I'm working now before then, I was a member of faculty at the University of Dar es Salaam. Now, coming this side, my critical role is to ensure we don't leave behind any child and youth who is not within the school system. So we bring back to school uh, all those who have missed the opportunity for formal schooling. And by the time I was joined, we had a pool of more than 3.5 million out of school in the country, and who I'm supposed to ensure we deliver uh, programs to them. Now, having seen Comfort that they are doing a critical work through the Lena Guy program to ensure they promote retention of learners, but they also engage the community to ensure they bring back to school learners, you can tell that my passion was now into supporting what Comfort is doing out of that. <coughs> and now this question that uh, Lydia is, is, is asking right now, you can just later on visit our website and see the number of youth that we are bringing back to school in the country. And uh, but this question uh, that is coming to me regarding my experience on the success uh, during this uh, in the course of, of, of the co-creation, I will really speak some few things. The first thing is uh, we were at the first time they had to form. We had to form all of us. What uh, Dr. Mkanleka before mentioned is the SAC team, the the SAC team, and uh, the formation of the team itself was some that is to learn as an experience. Because in the formation, the team was actually inclusive and it was multi-sectoral. It was not only targeting officials from the Ministry of Education, but it was including all ministries who are actually have a stake in ensuring that children are in school. So um, that is to say, in terms of discussions and, uh, and decision making, then we ha you have inputs from different sectors that will help us to facilitate uh, the, um, the, the scaling process. So what do we say, Comfort did not sit alone, but it engaged the government in not only education, 
but it had the, you know, first of all, they identified who are the key actors within the within this uh, 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 issue, and we are so much happy, me being part of the SAC member, that has been so much instrumental to reach us this far. But the second thing was the, now, it's not just the matter of uh, having the SAC, but it was the, uh, having the right people in, in the SAC. We were so much lucky in Tanzania to have, uh, you know, the SAC members who are so much committed and who owned the process. All of us, I represent my colleagues, but all, all of us, we can answer to questions on what is happening at the school level. So what do we make high level decisions to advise the government? We actually uh, have evidence based, uh, you know, information to really uh, engage in the decision processes. So you can have, you know, a team that is not committed, but on our end in the country, we were so lucky that when the team was formed, all the people had passion for ed for education and we are still working together and they know that I'm here representing them. But the other thing is, uh, was the opportunity that we have had together as a SAC member to learn within ourselves across the ministry. For example, if you say, we want guys to come and volunteer, but this is not the issue of education alone. What, what, what you colleagues are doing in your ministry. So that opportunity to learn from each other, but also the opportunity to learn from Zambia and from Zimbabwe, uh, uh, there you are. And so you can find some of the decisions we are making that actually are informed by our experiences that we have accumulated in visiting each other as as SAC members. So we have a critical, uh, you know, uh, evidences and uh, uh, through these learning processes. But what is more, in the SAC formation, we had what we call the technical working group under the SAC. This was very instrumental to us. Because some of the uh, some of the decisions we were supposed to make and and advise the government wanted evidences, and the technical technical uh, I mean, team was helping us to accumulate evidences that will assist us to make decision. Now it was important to have a SAC, but it was also critically important to have technical team and us that will uh, look for evidences and will help us to have confidence when we make decisions and advice at the government. And finally, what I will say is that uh, the comfort was not, you know, for lack of a better term, conservative. Like that is to say, it, it, it was that much open. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, because when you get the government, you know, you come with an idea, <laughs> but you need to allow decisions, discussions, and, uh, you know, all of us, we, we, uh, we discuss and we reach consensus for uh, this is much more better. <coughs> so we, all of us, we allowed ourselves to freely reach consensus on what we need to do in the scaling process. And this is what is all about in the co-creation. You come with your idea, I come with my idea, and in the course of discussion, we allow evidences to help us to reach into a decision. And this is my experience, I will say, that is very much helpful to drive us as a SAC into the scaling process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Senfeo. Can I add something? Yes, okay. please. Thank you very much. Uh, since you are talking about the system transformation, this reminds me that in this year, we launched the launch the, the, the teacher, GP teacher supporting program and uh, funded under GPE. Comfed was one of the member of the task team from, from participated from the application of the GP supporting application pro system transformation application program. So starting from gathering evidence or whereby you know they have to provide the education, education uh, I mean, uh, enabling fact analysis, where you need to provide evidence from wherever sources we have. So we had some, some evidence from the comfort, including this learner guide program, how youth can be participatory fully, fully in, the, in, in the community engagement, and what the challenge of the leadership, particularly female leadership in education, some evidence we get from that. And also, we participated fully in the design of the compact, uh, compact partnership, where we submit and get the, 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 the award of almost 80% from that, and 20% were reserved from, for, for further uh, trigger to, to be accomplished. And later on, we designed the program. 
the, or the teacher supporting program. So among the, if you look at the program, one of the components among the outcomes which we are, we, are, we are putting in is about the female education. And uh, you'll ask ourselves why female education? Because that is the core creation. We from the government, we are, when we, 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 we receive the information, as my colleague was saying, we get the information, the evidence, then we digest it because we see what, we, we, we need to convince each other based on evidence. Data suggests that, okay, we have this challenge for participation of the leadership. The issues for the police reforms, of course, we are working on that, but the issues are for the, how can we expect, uh, ex extend access for female education to, to support more on that area. So we have some on that area. But also, how can we leverage the issue of the volunteering, which is how the youth are now volunteering. We take that as, as one of the, 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 in, in the strategies in the program. So there are some components within the, the, the comfort which we are putting at the practice, but from the government perspective, through that program, teacher, teacher supporting program, we've taken, we've taken that as the strategies now, working on nationalized, not only in the specific area where the comfort is working, but the initial point, what I want to mention is that from the co-creation uh, perspective, it's not only we are, we are working on that small, small areas of where of the objective we are working at, 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 at that particular point. But from the government point, point of view, we take the lesson as a pilot and we can scale up throughout the country because it's a, it's a mandate of the government to ensure the country is provi provided with education. That is very helpful to add, uh, uh, Mr. Sanga, because uh, I was going to ask you how the learner guide program is aligned with the priority for the government because if we are to reach each and every child, then a program like this uh, would find its way in the, in the mainstream system of the government. And uh, you clearly have highlighted some of the priorities and the alignment with the learner guide program, but I don't know whether you have uh, any more um, ways through which a uh, learner guide program is aligned with the government priorities? Yeah, it's true that, um, first of all, the, 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 as I said earlier, since the, the, the objective of the program is increasing the access mm. and uh, improving the retention and based on the context. You know what, what the, the, in the school settings, in the education, even if we have a strong teacher, we have the strong le uh, leadership with the school the administration, but it's bounded within the school settings. Cannot go outside, even if you're a better teacher. When you go out to the, 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 the school environment, you cannot be practicing whatever you want to practice. You can still only observing and recording. When you, can, when you go back to your school in setting now, you can be responding to your teach students, okay? I saw you yesterday in, the, in this and this occasion. What, what were you doing? Can you give us a lesson on that? But we cannot ask them while you are outside the community. Even if you are in, 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 in train, maybe in the, in, in the tax, you can also, okay, I saw you a student. Why did you do the, the homework yesterday? Why didn't you? you cannot ask that one. <laughs> Unless at the issue we have the uh, very peer kind of the relationship. So the only provision of the youth community uh, in, in that support it great, to a great extent the, 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 in, in terms of improving their school student learning attendance, because they are working on the environment, on their locality, they address, they bring the real situation of the, the community. And it's become easier for teacher now to guide in terms of how to support them. Maybe you know this, can, this, this cannot attend to because in the, in the family, they have this problem, with maybe poverty, maybe could be a relationship with between husband and wife, maybe is, is like, like that or the social issues. It's easier now for the school administrators to support them. So this, we found that this is a instrumental to us in terms of how can we leverage them in improving attendance and later on improving retention. So it is in line with that mission we had in, in, our, in our country on how to improve, uh, ensure that everybody is not, not, not left behind, particularly from the marginalized group. We can support them in the urban areas, no problem, but in the, from the marginalized group where the comfort is working, is of great importance to that. And another aspect is, um, is, is, is providing the, 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 the evidence of the 
model, role model. Because these uh, what we call the learner guides, uh, uh, most of them work at the model. But I've been as part of the policy and planning department and research and 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 and, uh, and uh, innovation. We've been work full up on that, and also I'm part of the technical uh, technical team, as you mentioned from the comfort. We're doing the the mail team making for up. We have evidence from that. They are strong leadership evidence. So to them, the empowering girls for address the issue of the participation of girls, participation of the female in the education leadership. So it's give the, the confidence to them, okay, they can do, why this one can do, so it is possible for them. So it's, it's complement of the what government is to, intending to ensure that uh, everybody addressing the issue of the family, uh, female participation in the, in the leadership. So starting from the, you cannot address these issues at the, at the top level at adult level. We need to start it from the school level. And the school level, where can it be possible because of this learner guide? Where they provide the evidence. But also, we are, ad 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 we are advocating the issue of the gender equity. Now, through the program, does not increase, um, uh, provide more uh, challenge, because sometimes it's a challenge that uh, when you are addressing the issue of equity, Sometimes you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you look at uh, you not, not, not reducing, the, uh, solving the, the challenge of equity, but also increasing the, the diversity from one area to another. So it might be possible, probably the company could come, okay, since you are working on girls, whatever support we are, we are moving to schools, we now call all girls, address the, the issues, and leave boys behind. But this model is different. So whatever they talk about, about the skills, about the training, about the knowledge, provide both for girls and for, for boys. And probably this is different from other program which we have been witnessed at the government. Some, we had, we, we had, we had, a, we had a visit in, the, I remember, in, in, in four, five, four years back, when we have one of the big people from GP came to Tanzania, we had a visit. And all of us in the team concentrated for girls. And boys were looking at us. And some of them called up, can you talk to us? All of you, you are talking to girls. <laughs> can you talk to us? So they were, they were looking in the windows, starting from their classrooms. Everybody was calling girls to discuss with them, address their challenges. So in this case, you see, you have many programs in, the, in, the, in supporting education, as we have heard from the from speakers. But are we still having the same challenges? The reason behind probably we wanted to address the challenges, but the, the, the modality, the, the methodology we are using, increasing more disparities rather than addressing the, the disparities. So with this model, which you, as government we are working with, is when we are implementing the school level, we train them in the classroom, both boys and girls understand the concept. So even the boys come outside the school system, become a father, will already know on how to handle. So there is a sustainability through the, the process. Rather than training all girls, when they're coming to become married in somewhere, like a, 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 a man does not understand that, so that will be struggling from the starting from the family level. But when understanding from this classroom level, when they come out, today's children is tomorrow's fathers and mothers. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. So it looks like things are already happening in terms of uh, scaling in Tanzania through the government system. Anna, can you highlight what exactly is happening? And probably I'll pass on it to Dr. Sempel too, to just tease out of what is happening with the, within the government system in terms of adapting the Lena Guide program now. Okay. Um, the process is the same, co-creation. So we started the Lena Guide into um, 33 uh, districts and uh, then with the scaling advisory committee we sat down and said we are now going for the scale with the government so the first thing we did is um we charted the scaling plan how are we going to do the scaling and as dr Semper was highlighting uh, within the scaling advisory committee we had different technical uh, technical teams so one of the technical team within was um, dealing with the packaging of the of the of the content of the of the my better world sessions. 
So the fact they said um, we need to make sure that uh, the content is well packed and uh, uh, aligning with the, the, the criteria of the, of the government. So they took initiative to, through the Tanzania Institute of Adult Education to, to review the content, the same content with the same meaning, but packaging it to, to, to meet the government criteria. So that one is, is, is sorted and now the, the content has been adapted to the, to the safe, safe school uh, materials for the peer-to-peer -peer support. And uh, the next thing was, uh, how are we moving forward? So we said, instead of going massively uh, to other districts, let's start by piloting into at least the three districts. And we see how is it going. And Alida was talking about learning. Actually, Mital was thinking about within the process of the systems transformation, uh, we should be able to learn, uh, challenge, and adapt the changes as we know that um, systems transformation is not static. What might work well today may be different tomorrow. So as you scale, as you learn the systems transformation, also you should be open to, 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 to learning. So the lessons we took from the, the, the three districts that we piloted last year has um, enabled us to move to, to new 41 districts from next year. So this year, as we start introducing the program to, to these 41 new districts, we are working with the government and to now it has taken a new shape. It's no longer comfort uh, doing the scaling. It's the government uh, doing it from the, from the recruitment process to the, to the training. Government is, I mean, comfort is now there to, to support as a technical advisors to how the program is, is run. So from where we started to 33 districts, we are now moving to plus 41 mathematics now. Yeah, <laughs> there are people, 74 professors in exactly. mathematics. <laughs> 74 districts in uh, 2025. That's, that's where we are. And we are so proud to say um, it's now the government way. We are now starting to see the systems transformation taking place, the embedding of the, of the learner guide program into the system, as Sangha was saying. Uh, last year, we reviewed our education policy, uh, education policy, where we have now starting to see the issue of life skills. We can presented about the 2020, life, mm. 2010 life skills um, guideline. But again, we are now seeing the issue of peer to peer support taking a new shape as one of the of the of the the important aspect into into education sector so that's where we are now hoping <laughs> yeah and you know um, to, to sum up our vision to 2030 is to make sure that we are reaching at least not less than 85 of all schools in the countries thank you and that means millions more yeah. boys and girls are uh, rich with these uh, important skills and mentorship uh, that they deserve. Dr. Sempeo, do you have additional things that are happening apart from what Anna has just mentioned? Yeah, seriously, I will just add uh, three more tangible um, uh, output that we have so far uh, achieved that are happening right now in the country. Uh, the first thing is, uh, we have been able uh, to identify the entry points mm -hmm. for scaling up, which is very critical. Yeah. And um, uh, these uh, entry points, they are of different, uh, you know, uh, they are different actually. One of the entry points that have been identified so far is uh, we have recently had reforms on the education training policy in the country, and we had now used that as an opportunity to ensure uh, that the scaling process is an integral uh, of the uh, policy reforms when it comes to girls' education and the involvement of the peer-based mentors in supporting learning. But the second thing in terms of, uh, of the entry points was leveraging uh, the new guidelines in the government on volunteerism. Now in Tanzania, 
we have a new guideline issued by the Prime Minister mm -hmm. that advocates for our youth to be volunteers after they have finished the period of uh, program study. Now, with that, we know learner guys, they work as volunteers in the country. Now, as we scale up in the government, the question is, are there structures, are there frameworks in the government that will support engagement of volunteers? Now, we are saying we have been able to arrive to that. We have a national guideline, which is now open document in the website. You can search and read it. And, uh, and uh, that to us is a, a great milestone. Uh, the other thing that we have been able in terms of entry point was the, you know, when we started the process, um, some of our colleagues died, you know, in the process, who were actually part of the process in the present office. But we have now the output that there has been a structural reforms at the present office. And you can now see in every LG in the country, there is a new appointment of uh, what we call the district adult education officer at the primary and secondary education level who are in charge of the guidance and counseling at the LGA. And under them, there are what we call guidance and counseling teachers who are closely working to support the work of the inner guides in the country. So in terms of a structure, in the country we have traveled a milestone mm -hmm. that can sustain the program. Mm. But apart from that, um, I'm saying now we have now the guidance and custom teachers everywhere in the country who have been trained. Now the question that was uh, before presented by colleagues from University of Dar es Salaam to say people wanted to engage teachers as learner guides. Now it, it will no longer be there because they're actually present and then they will now be engaged to support mentors, the peers. Because when the peers are coming, they also need to be mentored themselves by the teachers in how they can really uh, function within the school uh, setting. So there is a bridge now between learner guides and the school administration, and these are the guides and custom teachers who are part of now the government structure uh, in Tanzania. What is more, um, in that is the now the Nana has already mentioned about the the, the accreditation of the of the book uh, as well as the uh, secular involvement. Now this is the first uh, thing I want to mention on the entry points. The second thing was on the um, um, what what I would say is the creation or, or development of the uh, pilot scaling plan between us from the government and comfort now this is happening Anna has just you know said uh, part of it that is it is no longer no comfort doing it but we are doing it together and we have developed you know a plan to scale up the the, the program in the power district now this is happening and it is something that something that we can be you know proud of to say is a master we have traveled and finally what I will critically say now is during the study, they mentioned in the study that learner guides, one of their expectations to be, because being a volunteer, you have some expectations, whether gaining more work-based skills or many others, we know that. Now, one of the expectations when we visited the centers was before being learner guide, they were trained through BT qualifications. And they said, we thought that BTA qualification would allow us to progress, to transit into higher levels of education, only to find that within our government system, the modules covered under BTEC, they cannot support their progression. You see now? So what is our challenge as SAC members is to tackle that question, what can be done now to meet this expectation? Now, what is happening now, there is a time I'm using, and this is the hybridization of comfort beta qualification. I'm using this word, whether it's a proper term or not, I'm a Swahili speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to learn English, but uh, so I'm using the word hybridization of comfort beta qualification to say, what can we add into their qualification mm -hmm. to get them recognize within our education system. 
now I was lucky because when we started, I was on the director. <laughs> but in the process, I think the government saw the need to appoint me being a director in charge of the academics. Now, uh, in my desk, we have already <laughs> set plans because it is in my desk now to ensure we now we're close with comfort and colleagues from UK who trained, uh, you know, uh, Lena guys through BTEC to ensure can we now habitized? Can we now uh, um, make it standardized within our government uh, uh, education system? And I wish by God's grace before my, my time is due uh, in, uh, as a director Amen. that we will be able, <laughs> we will be able to have the first batch, the first, the first batch of, uh, of learner guides who are graduating by habitizing the BTEC. So I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, because all of us, we know what, what we want now. Mm. So all of us, colleagues mm -hmm. from UK and we from Tanzania, because we need to be engaged, all of us in the process, you have trained, we need to add on what has been trained to them. And if we graduate the first batch, I'm telling you, it's going to be a very big milestone and it is an impact that will last in the lives of the Nagas. Thank you. Great. You have actually uh, responded to my last question to both of you on what will it take to sustain the outcome, how to put the outcome and the impact of this integration. Because it's one thing to say this is a very good initiative, mm -hmm. and then it's another thing to integrate with the existing system so that it can just scale and reach and everyone. But it's another thing to be able to sustain this momentum and make sure that it is embedded within the government and it can just run on its own. So Dr. Sempio, I think you have highlighted some of the things that are on your table as a director to make sure that this is sustained. But uh, Anna and, um, and uh, Lawrence, what will it take? What more will it take to sustain the outcome of this, of this integration of the Renegade program? Can I come here? Yes, please. <laughs> thank, th thank you very much, and thank you very much. And I will ask you, audience, you are not just listening. <laughs> what will it take? What do you think it will take, <laughs> both of us and the government, to sustain this momentum? Yeah, from the government perspective, one of the, 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 the issues which might be bring a challenge if whatever program we are, do, we are, we are doing, if the program comes to, to create a parallel system. Because when you get a parallel system at the end of the program, then it will be end of everything. So it's a challenge to ensure that, that's why we are working together to ensure that whatever we are doing, we are not creating a parallel system. We are using the existing systems. If you want to look about the supervision of the program, let's use the existing supervisors in the education. If you're about to look about the quality assurance, we're not providing a new quality assurance from outside the, the, the government setting. It's okay, we have the quality assurance system. Let's see how better can we use them. If we wanted to improve them in terms of the uh, upgrading learner guided qualification as the director was trying to, to explain, we cannot say, okay, we have another separate system. We need to use the existing system based on the mandatory. So if other, ten, other ten institute education is mandatory to do that, it's working on that. If mm. it is the university, mm. it's mandatory to do that, we'll see. We'll mm. sit together and look at the program to see from the mandate of the universities can do this one, from the mandate of the institution can do this one, from the mandate of the particular college can do that. So we work on the existing system. So it is, that will be bringing the sustainability and that will be bring more ownership. We'll not say this comfort program, we say this is our program because now everybody will be part and parcel in the process. Thank you. But secondly, and lastly, <laughs> that, <laughs> running out of time. <laughs> yeah, the last, of the, the, the last point is that um, to expand this program need require resources. Mm -hmm. So you, it's no one big, big mother who can provide the resource to come to address all the challenges in the, in the, in the girls' education globally. So we need to how to partner ourselves in terms of how to mobilize the resources. So by engaging government, it means the government might provide some of the resources because we are using the same system. If for instance, you are working with the school environment, then the venue, the, the, wherever the support come from the government, you only provide technical support to work on that. So, that, but if you are working in terms of the parallel structure, it means that you will be hiring everything to, to support the program. 
But now, since we are taking as part of the system, some of the resources will come from within the government. Some of the, even the trainers will come from them. We are not exporting them, the trainers from outside the country. Now we take them within the government. That means mobilizing effective utility resources. And that will bring more sustainability to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanga. I'm very happy to be surrounded here um, by a colleague, um, Dr. Lulu Mahai, who is the director of the Institute of Gender Studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, who has been heading the research um, that we've been hearing about today, along with Eddie, who we've also already met. So we've got the three partners here together, and of course our collaborators, which we've just been hearing from government too. So we just wanted to reflect briefly on next steps and um, where we might go from here. And I think we'd be happy in the reception afterwards, if you can stay for a drink next door, then to also get your thoughts on what the next steps were. But Lulu, you have to say a few words. Um, I thank you very much. Uh, I call her professor because we respect the professors in Tanzania. Uh, <laughs> professor Pauline for uh, introducing us, but I also, uh, appreciating what the research team uh, came out with from the, the field and also the way policymakers tried to inform us on the role of comfort as well as what uh, Tanzanian government is doing in relation to expanding education but also supporting gender equality initiatives. And uh, reflecting on that, I can say we have achieved a, a very big uh, milestone in terms of uh, the findings on uh, shifting agenda norms in Tanzania and the way Comfort are working, the groundwork that is uh, really visible with the sound evidence. And some of them were presented here by my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Mgonda and Dr. Rosie Waipopo. Uh, what have I grasped out of the presentations from morning to now? It's like we have uh, uh, three areas. One is research, second is training, three is on community-based approach that Comfort is adopting. Uh, in terms of research, I see some opportunities to reflect further uh, on the way uh, Comfort uh, is working on learner guide a program. We have findings from Tanzania, but they are working with Zimbabwe and they're working with uh, uh, Zambia. Can we reflect on a comparative uh, study just to find out what is happening in other areas? That's one area. Uh, secondly, we can go further and reflect on the way a comfort learner guide a program is engaged in the communities, the way uh, learner guides are supported, are developed, the skills that uh, are embraced to enable students in secondary schools also uh, develop potential uh, skills and become knowledgeable to run away from harmful gender norms, for example. With that, is it possible to think about comfort or learner guide program? as part of the community-based research approach. What should we do to complement the effort? What should we do to repackage the Comfort program to make it more community-based approach? And if possible, Pauline, my dear professor, you can explore on this. <laughs> and uh, and uh, if need be, uh, we can work together on that. Uh -huh. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, supporting a capacity uh, building, we have heard when uh, they were presenting in terms of uh, uh, perceived low qualification. That scared me a little bit because I understand that uh, with learner guide program uh, uh, being uh, operationalized in the country, we have a very big milestone that we have achieved, but we cannot ignore such a comment from research that there is perceived low qualification among our learner guides. What should we do to enable these 
people whom we consider very potential to support our students in secondary schools, our girls in secondary schools. Develop what it takes and complement the effort and remove this, I call it a stigma of saying they have low qualifications. Mm -mm. What should we do? Should we think of another intervention within intervention? I leave it to comfort. What can the University of Dar es Salaam do? The University of Dar es Salaam, if you look at it, can provide a technical a support to develop uh, programs that can support in developing capacity of these learner guides, if at all we are given chance. But secondly, we can also provide uh, uh, research competencies because we have researchers grown in Tanzania, studied in Tanzania, they understand the environment, just like the way we were working with a, a real center by providing support at the grassroots level, we are also ready to carry out further studies given opportunity. Lastly, I welcome all of you to come visit Tanzania, come to the University of Dar es Salaam, supporting the capacity building of our undergraduate and master's students, and above all, supporting shifting gender norms from low level to very high levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lulu. I'm definitely going to be led by you, so uh, <laughs> Linda, to Olivia. That was very professionally, statistically <laughs> significant <laughs> to a point that you can't disqualify with my comments, uh, Professor. But uh, from comfort perspective, the co-creation model is our way, mm -hmm. right? Don't even say about being given a chance. Aren't we talking about we are co-creating things here? Thank you, Lydia. We are partnering with researchers, with government, with the communities, with the young people you know, to be able to co-create something. Don't come with your theory of change to train us. Mm -mm, uh -uh. Mm -mm. Come with those things you talked about as questions. <laughs> okay. And then we sit with young people and including the learner guides, we, talk, we, we, we saw the skill gap there. Mm. Is this a skill gap, is, is it that will benefit us or mm. is it also that will benefit them? Mm. What is it that they will gain from the capacity building program strategy that you want to put on the table? And surely those answers will come from the ambitions and the aspirations of these young women who are volunteering. So I think what I can say for comfort, our co the co-creation is the model and is our way through which uh, uh, one of the participants talked about the power dynamics. When in this co-creation, one of the things that we are intentional is breaking the power dynamics. If I am here, I am a learner guide and sitting with the Pauline, it's because I know the things that the Pauline doesn't know. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> so, there is no power here. Mm -hmm. The power I have is the fact that I have lived the experience of poverty while Pauline studied about poverty. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 when Pauline comes on the table and I come on the table, we can co-create something that will you know, be excellent. So I think uh, for us is really this model to embrace it so that we can continue leveraging the partnership and the skills and the power and the resources that we can all galvanize to move forward. And I agree yes, with right. you. It's a, it's a blessing to have been able to partner with the real center here. You talked about, uh, you know, from the beginning, 10 years, and everyone else who have brought the resources and the expertise, and we cherish that. And I think if we continue with this really, um, through collaboration, through the co-creation, I think we'll come up with our next step that will really leverage um, the opportunities that we have already seen. So I think I can call you both my sisters. I think we're, we're here as a family, and as with all families, we might have our arguments along the way, as Yusuf might have implied, but actually we're still sitting here together smiling. So, and I think you'll agree that throughout what we've been listening to have achieved a lot through this co-creation. Um, and I would just say, Katie, what works hub maybe change implementation science to what to co-creation? Don't you think that sounds better? I think so. That, 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 <laughs> That big words. Mm. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah. So, so that's one recommendation. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, I think you know, as I started by saying, in terms of next steps for us, the co-creation is what's at the heart of this. So, the sort of things that are going to be helpful and relevant, and I think 
as I was also listening to what was happening with the scaling up in the government, I was just thinking, well, maybe it might be also interesting to look at what the impact is as that scaling up is done. We've, I think the sort of what we heard about today was really the richness. I was, I'm so impressed with the richness that um, colleagues have got from the, the qualitative data. So impressive that they filled workers, field supervisors, the research assistants, the University of Dar es Salaam, overseen by yourselves. And I think it's just, just amazing. There was some quantitative um, research that was done alongside this that we didn't have time to present. I don't know if Ricardo is in the room, doc, together with Dr. Richard Shakir from the University of Dar es Salaam mm -hmm. and other colleagues, um, which was also helping to show what the impact of that initial piloting was. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that's just, just one additional thought to the ones that have alre already been mentioned. Um, I think, sort of, for me, this is an amazing journey and we're looking forward to continuing it. Um, I'm just going to end um, with a thanks, and I'm not going to mention everybody because we would be here for a very long time and there are drinks next door. Um, but really, <laughs> thank you, first of all, to those who've been involved in the research process, the, uh, all of our collaborators, those who might be online as well, um, who have been engaged as the field supervisors and research analysts also here um, in, in Cambridge. They've done a fantastic job. And I mean, if you knew the intensity of the timescale that we had and what's been achieved, as, as, as was said, this is all on, on the website, really rich material. I mean, think we're thankful to everybody in the teams that have, have been involved. We're, of course, also thankful to the um, funders. Uh, this has been funded by sort of different um, sources, including the Global Partnership for Education, Knowledge and Innovation Exchange, KICS programme. The Alan and Jill Gray philanthropy has really been at the heart of, of the funding um, for the work that we've been hearing about. And I think the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office has been important for the establishment of the work that's been going on in CAMFED in, um, in, CAMFED in Tanzania and in other countries. And I should say, as part of work that together with Malaza Schindler and other colleagues are doing, we are hoping to do a study in the not too distant future with CAMFED in Zimbabwe, looking at the sustainability, mm -hmm. how the programme has been sustained. I think that's already sort of come up in a lot of the discussion already today. Um, thank you, huge thank you to all the speakers. I mean, I think they've been amazing, such, such an array of different perspectives. Um, you know, we're sitting here in a university and I think it's so important and impactful to hear not just from researchers, which are important, but also from government, from implementers, from funders. I think that sort of combination just speaks so powerfully. Um, so, and I think just, of course, all of the participants both here in, in the room and online have been hugely important for the success of this event and hopefully in taking forward some of the ideas in, to, in all of our work. And I was really impressed with um, what Julia was saying, and it just made me think, we didn't have it today, but almost every time we talk about gender and girls' education, somebody says, what about the boys? And I think the evidence she presented told us very strongly about why continuing to focus on gender inequality is so important and powerful. Mm -hmm. So thank you to all of those who are working to achieve these aims.